Subcommittee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on the weaponization of the federal government. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey, to lead us all in the Pledge of Allegiance. the enthusiasm. <laughs> we'll start with opening statements, uh, then move into our witnesses. Uh, the chair directed himself for an opening statement. Big government was colluding with big tech to censor Americans. That's the first thing we learned. But now it's big government colluding with big banks and big business to spy on everything Americans buy, every place they go, everything they do. Big government wants your financial data because it's full of sensitive information about you. Our investigation started when an FBI whistleblower, George Hill, came forward and talked to the committee. Mr. Hill was supervisory intelligence analyst at the FBI up in the Boston field. I was told the committee that the FBI got information from Bank of America. Specifically, it received a list of any customer who made purchases in the Washington, D.C. area January 5th through 7th, 2021. The whistleblower supervisor, special agent in charge of the Boston field office, Mr. Bonavalanta, corroborated Mr. Hill's testimony when he spoke to the committee. And so did Steve Jensen, the FBI's domestic terrorism operations section chief. But it wasn't just purchase data around a specific date that the FBI got from Bank of America. That was actually also overlaid with any firearm purchase at any time. And how did the FBI get this information? They asked for it. In fact, you can see on the, on the uh, display on the screen here the email that was sent. The FBI told Bank of America to recap our morning call. We are prepared to action immediately the following threshold customers confirmed as transacting business in Washington, D.C. between these specific dates. So if you're in Washington, D.C., visiting your kids, maybe visiting your aunt, or maybe just a friend, the FBI wanted to know about every single purchase you made. And, and if you're a gun owner, look out, you're going to the top of the list. For simply exercising your Second Amendment right, you're on the FBI's target list. And never forget, the federal government got this information without any process, no warrant, and frankly, no notification. The bank didn't tell the customer that, we're, hey, we're handing this information over to the FBI, the most powerful law enforcement agency in the world. Now, these FBI agents, Mr. Hill, Mr. Bonavolante, Mr. Jensen, they all said this was wrong and, in fact, sent the information back to FBI headquarters in D.C. So that's how our investigation began. But since then, and we continue to investigate, but since then, We've learned that the financial surveillance was broader and there was actually a specific objective. The federal government is building profiles on the American people. And the profile isn't based on criminal conduct, it's based on political beliefs. And if you got the wrong political beliefs, well, you're potentially a domestic violent extremist. Now, how are they actually doing this? What are the mechanics of this? There's this entity we've discovered called the Domestic Security Alliance Council, kind of Orwellian in, uh, in sound and title the DSAC, and this is an entity where the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, works with 650 of the largest companies in the world. These companies have to do over a billion dollars in revenue a year. They represent two-thirds of the gross domestic product of the United States economy. And they work through this controlled access portal. We'll put that on the screen here. What are they sharing in this secret portal? Well, we're not exactly sure because it's secret. But we do know that they share some information, share reports. And one of the reports we got called a liaison information report said this, any American who opposes, any American who opposes firearm legislation, 
the easing of immigration restrictions and COVID mandates is someone banks should be watching because again, they might be an extremist. Now stop and think about that for a second. I mean, just in other words, if, if you're against gun registration, you're for a secured border, you oppose lockdowns and vaccine mandates, you're a domestic violent extremist, according to the FBI, and the government should get your data, should get your financial data. It actually gets worse. The federal government and banks also use what they call merchant category codes to flag Americans that shop at places like Bass Pro Shop and Cabela's. They flagged Americans who bought religious text. We can show you that one too. Because everybody knows if you want a secure border and you oppose COVID lockdowns, then you probably shop at Bass Pro Shops and you read your Bible. And of course, all that makes you an extremist. Literally, that is the logic that you, you see displayed from the information we've been able to gather thus far in our investigation. Now remember, these are also the same folks who just a couple years ago told us if you're a parent showing up at a school board meeting, you're a terrorist. If you're a pro-life Catholic, you're an extremist. Now, of course, if you oppose lockdowns, vaccine mandates, want a secure border, don't want gun registration, you're in that category as well. This is scary where things are headed. We've seen the censorship, now we see what's happening with big banks and, and big government relative to your financial data. Again, all this being done with no process, no warrant, no notification to the customer that the banks are actually supposed to serve. Big government's not supposed to use big tech to censor Americans, and big government shouldn't be working with big banks to target Americans for behavior that is legal and constitutional. And that's the concern. That's why we're having this here, and we will get to our guest here in a second. But with that, I would yield to the ranking member for an opening statement before we get to our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to everyone that's here uh, at this hearing. I'm glad that the chairman opened with who instigated this hearing, which is George Hill and what the purpose of this hearing is. At the end of the day, the purpose of this hearing is to minimize what happened on January 6th and the lawful prosecution of individuals who were engaged in that practice. The chairman wants us to believe that People are being persecuted for their political conduct rather than their criminal behavior. So basically he's trying to tell us that everyone who's been indicted and prosecuted for January 6th did not engage in criminal conduct? That's the logic of what he's saying and it's, we've just come so low in this, part, in this house. It's just frightening to me what people will do to try and minimize the work of those individuals who came to this Capitol on January 6th. This entire Republican conspiracy theory was launched based on the testimony of a so-called whistleblower, George Hill. He appeared for a transcribed interview last year Mr. Hill claimed that the FBI was using the Bank of America to survey Americans. All Americans? Not all Americans. Everyone who owns a firearm, as the chairman said, not everyone who owns a firearm. The picking and choosing of language within an entire report is just inappropriate information giving to the American people. Give them all of it so that they can see the true picture. Tell half a story, you're not telling the truth. The FBI asked the Bank of America for information on individuals who fit three categories. People who came, that there is evidence that they were here on January 6th, that they purchased a firearm in the last six months and that's key, and, not or, and they plan to come back for the inauguration. And they know that they were coming back for the inauguration based on 
Airbnb purchases, hotel, RSVPs in the DMV area. And they were individuals who had come on January 6th and know that through those purchases as well. And these were not all of the people that they were looking at, but what was the purchase purpose of this? It was to make sure that a January 6th event didn't happen on inauguration because people were talking about it. They talk, you know, you had up there DMVs. Do we know what DMVs are? I just want to tell you that. It's domestic terrorists. Individuals engage in domestic violence. That happens. When it's people who fit your political agenda, they're not criminals anymore. They're patriots. They're uh, victims. They're not. They're criminals. And a jury of their peers found that when so many of them have been prosecuted in our court of law. Not by brown shirts, not by Nancy Pelosi, not by Biden's Justice Department, by a jury of their peers. And it's surprising that we don't have George Hill here today because in the same way that their star witness on their impeachment, Alexander Smirnoff, remember him? who was their key, key witness in the Hunter Biden impeachment probe, until we found out that everything he said was made up and he actually got his information from Russia. We don't know what's gonna happen with George Hill, but we can pretty well guess based on the track record. I wanna thank our witnesses for being here. We don't always agree on things that witnesses say, but we thank them for their willingness to come and give their thoughts and be questioned by members of Congress here and of this hearing. I particularly want to thank Mr. Fanon for being here with us today. I want to thank him publicly for his bravery and his willingness in sharing his traumatic, harrowing experience so publicly so that we can understand and so that there can be truth juxtaposed to falsehoods. I'm sorry for you and all the men and women who fought on the front lines just steps away from this room that we're in today to protect all of us in this building, from staff, from the architects uh, of the Capitol, to members of Congress, to the young people who were here. My experience here today is nothing compared to what those officers went, went through. And Mr. Fanon, while those of us on the dais were being protected in insecure locations, some of us fearing for our lives, many of us on both sides of the aisle fearing for their life on that day that they've quickly forgotten about after visits to Mar-a-Lago, I wanna thank you, because you saw it all, because you were out there you didn't hide, you ran towards danger. You went out to meet the mob. You and your brothers and sisters in blue went out and did that. And I wanted to share just a reminder of what really occurred on that day. That's a battle scene. That's what that is. That's a battle scene. That is not political discord. That's criminal behavior. That's what that is. And while police, Capitol Police officers were slipping in blood, 
on the ground as they fought their fellow officers' fight in that insurrection, those of us who were in the Capitol, those members of Congress and staff were seeking shelter. And unfortunately, Mr. Fanon, you have met the times that we are in. You have given up your safety to secure truth. Unfortunately, many of my colleagues on the other side know the truth, but they're still seeking shelter from Donald Trump's hordes. They're still seeking shelter from the truth. They want to protect not them, just themselves, but their political careers, their jobs. They're hiding behind lies for that. We know what happened, not just by those videos and footage, but the nearly 1,000 convictions obtained against those rioters across an array of jurisdictions. Conviction from career prosecutors, not political hacks, with juries of the defendant's peers, everyday Americans who saw the evidence. Evidence that has been obtained by prosecutors and investigators have worked to hold these violent individuals accountable for their horrendous deeds. So, I got a lot of else that I could have talked about. But I guess we'll get to it. General Lady yields back. Without objection, all of their opening statements will be included in the record. We now introduce today's witnesses. Dr. Jordan Peterson is a psychologist, author, and professor emeritus at the University of Toronto. He previously taught at Harvard University and McGill University. He has published more than 100 scientific papers, hosts a popular podcast, hosts public lectures across the United States, Canada, Australia, and Europe, and offers online programs to help consumers better understand their personalities and themselves. Dr. Peterson has been targeted for his views on the importance of free speech and traditional values, and has warned of the dangers of debanking political opponents as he has seen in Canada. Mr. Brian Knight is uh, Director of Innovation and Governance at the senior and a Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center. He has research published widely on financial regulation, including the creation of pro-innovation regulatory environments, the role of regulation for credit markets and consumer protection, and the sharing of data between financial institutions, their regulators, and other federal entities. Mr. Jeremy Tedesco serves as senior counsel at this, uh, and the senior vice president of corporate engagement at the Alliance Defending Freedom. In these roles, he works to advance free speech, religious freedom, and human dignity in companies. He also works to prevent political and religious debanking at major financial institutions. I actually believe the Alliance for Defending Freedom is one of the, one of the entities targeted by the government in some of this correspondence, so we appreciate you being here as well. Mr. Norbert Michael is Vice President and Director of the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives at the Cato Institute. He has researched and published on issues pertaining to financial markets and monetary policy, including the Bank Secrecy Act, important, important piece of legislation that needs change. In particular, he has advocated for reforms that advance individuals' rights against government overreach and protecting personal financial privacy. Mr. Michael Fanone is a law enforcement analyst, security consultant, and firearms instructor. He previously served for 20 years as a police officer with the DC Metropolitan Police Department. We welcome our witnesses and thank them for appearing uh, uh, today. We'll begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. You may be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. We'll be a little lenient on the time, so if you go a little over, that's fine. If we go too far over, we may have to just move on to the next, but uh, you, many of you have done this before, so um, you know how this works. There's a microphone. We'd ask that you turn that on when you're, when you're testifying, uh, and we will start with Dr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Peterson, you're recognized for uh, five minutes. And thank you again for being here. Yes, well, I would like to start by expressing my uh, appreciation for the privilege awarded to me to testify here today. It, it really is an honor to be asked to do so. I'm not here to talk about January 6th or about any particular threat, insurrection, or protest, political or ideological, real or imaginary. I'm here to talk about the already extant and expanding collusion of government and corporation in restricting the individual freedom and autonomy upon which the productive, generous, 
and stable psyche, psyche, economy, and state are themselves necessarily founded. I'll begin my comments, therefore, in the most general terms to shed light on the mounting problem. There are now 700 million CCTVs in China under the rule of the Communist Party. The system to which those electronic eyes are attached is the most complete state apparatus of surveillance yet imagined, with the ability not only to recognize faces at a distance, but gate itself when facial features are hidden or obscured. Such capability can and will soon be augmented to the point where the movement of eyes themselves, monitored by high resolution and intelligent cameras, will soon be sufficient to identify any aware and active party. The demented, naive, and prideful engineers who so enthusiastically helped build this system call it Skynet. After the rogue and all-seeing technology that took such a dreadfully wrong term, turn in the famous science fiction movie Terminator series, featuring artificially intelligent robot intelligences hell-bent on protecting themselves by destroying humanity. The name also references a well-known Chinese phrase describing the reach of the divine itself. The net of heaven is vast, yet it misses nothing, which aptly describes the capabilities of the new state apparatus. The system is integrated with the so-called Chinese social credit system, which awards its involuntary participants with a score indicating their compliance with the dictates of the Chinese Communist Party, allowing for full control over access to everything they possess electronically, most ominously their savings and their access to travel, certainly all modern means of travel, but increasingly as the electronic gates come up even by walking. If you're a Chinese or a visitor, your access to the world can be reduced to zero if your social credit score falls beyond an arbitrary minimum. This allows you purposefully to be shut out of all activities that can be virtualized. And in a rapidly virtualizing world, this increasingly means all activities, driving, shopping, working, eating, finding shelter, even fraternizing with friends and family, as merely being in the presence of someone with a low social credit score means that your own score can be lowered. This has also opened up the opportunity for the government to extract slave-like labor from its citizens so burdened as the donation of free work to the state still constitute one means by which erring Chinese men and women can increase their score and remain part of human society. This is precisely the payment system most desired by the most tyrannical, not the work for me and benefit thereby that constitutes the contractual arrangement undertaken by free and sovereign citizens, but the work for me and I will lift the deprivation I imposed that has always been the late motif of the slaver. Why is any of this relevant to people in the West? Well, because the technology that the Chinese Communist Party employs is an extension of Western technology because we already fell prey to the terrible temptation of lockdown employed by that state in the face of hypothetical crisis once and in the very recent past, because we're walking step by step in the same direction, partly because of the hypothetical convenience of universal and automatic recognition of identity, and partly because any problem whatsoever that now confronts us can easily be used to justify the increasing reach of the security and nanny state. It is said that Stone Age people first confronted with cameras and their resultant photographs by modern anthropologists objected to having their images captured as they feared the captivity of their souls. It turns out that such fear was prescient. The images that we leave behind while navigating virtual space are such close duplicates of our actual selves that the capture of our essence is at this point all but guaranteed. We all now have our doppelgangers. We all live so much in the virtual world in consequence of our purchasing habits and modes of electronically mediated communication that our very selves have become reducible to a frightening degree to data, the modern equivalent of our footprint, with the same data making up an image of our identity. 
an identity which can be and is increasingly bought and sold by the invisible corporate brokers that still mostly use it to sell us what we so desperately and carelessly and conveniently want, but can also be used to track, monitor, and punish everything we do and say. Behavioral scientists facilitate this process with their reprehensible nudging, the practice of pushing people in a given ideologically determined direction by manipulating invisible incentives behind the scene. Corporations track purchasing decisions, developing algorithms that with increasing accuracy track our patterns of attention and action, allowing for the prediction of what might next be most enticing, doing so not only to offer us what we want, but to determine and shape what we need. Governments can and are colluding with these corporate agents to develop a picture not only of our actions, but of our thoughts and words, so that deviation from the desired end can be mapped, rewarded, and punished. The development of a digital identity and currency is nothing more than the likely end consequence of such inclinations, and the combination of both can and will facilitate the development of a surveillance state, the scope of which optimistic pessimists of totalitarianism such as George Orwell could scarcely imagine. The new AI systems, which are so rapidly emerging, do nothing but increase this danger, providing for the possibility of a super surveillance whose scope exceeds anything that mere unaugmented humans could imagine, while also making it certain that even the perceptions that in the real world shape our attitudes, conduct, and personality can, manip can be manipulated to the degree that we will not even be able to see a reality outside which that has been constructed by the superstate. The ultimate fascist collusion between gigantic self-interested corporations and paranoid security-obsessed anti-human governments. We're already selling our souls to the superstate for the purposes of immediate gratification while being enticed to do so by Mr. fear Mr. Chairman, ideologues. could the witness be asked to summarize, please? And do I, do I have my five minutes, or do I not? Yeah. You've gone over five Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I can, I can certainly... If, I can the, certainly if the witness could summarize, I, I'm, we're, we're always a little lenient with the I'll, time. If you I'll, could summarize... I'll take ten seconds. more seconds. Sure. Yeah. With increasing ability to monitor not only the actual attention patterns and behaviors of its citizens, but to predict those that are most likely the persecution of even potential crime becomes ever more likely. If you have nothing to hide, you will have nothing to fear, will be the slogan commandeered by those most likely to turn to surveillance to protect and control. What was the famous Soviet totalitarian joke attributed to Lavrenti Beria, head of the secret police? Show me the man and I'll show you the crime. Those words were true enough in the time of Stalin's KGB, and the police were secret enough then as well. But that's nothing compared to what we can and likely will produce now. A police so secret that we will not even be able to detect their comprehensive and subtle activity. Monitoring crime so pervasive that everyone under the dictates of the system will have something to hide their order, Mr. Fear. Chairman. Yep. Uh, the gentleman's uh, uh, time is uh, expired. We now go to Mr. Knight for your, uh, your statement. <clears throat> Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, and members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to be asked to testify. My name is Brian Knight, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, where my research focuses on financial regulation, including its use as a tool of broader policy. Americans write the story of their lives in their bank accounts. To function in a modern economy, Americans must create a trail of records that can reveal their movements, their religious and political beliefs, their sexual preferences, health conditions, whether they are likely to own a gun or have had an abortion. The government can access these records without meaningful due process or the person ever knowing it happened. It's perhaps unsurprising then that efforts to expand the use of financial surveillance are increasing. While potentially well-meaning, these efforts present a pressing threat to Americans' privacy and a glaring weakness in our constitutional order that should be addressed. A recent example of this is federal law enforcement and financial institutions collaborating to share financial records of an unknown number of Americans after January 6th. While publicly available information is limited, it appears this was done to identify suspects based on their movement, political and religious beliefs, and whether they owned a firearm. These searches use broad categories, many of which relate to lawful, sensitive, and constitutionally protected activity. This was apparently done under the Bank Secrecy Act, which allowed the information to be provided without a warrant or any outside check, and prevented the targets of the search from being told it happened. We only know it occurred because of the testimony of whistleblowers in the work of this subcommittee. We do not know how often similar techniques were used in the past, 
and if their use is currently ongoing. To add insult to injury, it's unclear that the data was even useful and was removed by the FBI, though only after it had been shared with at least two field offices. Now, it isn't surprising that after a serious crime and fearing more violence, that law enforcement would use every tool available. However, the way this appears to have happened is emblematic of the serious defects in our protection of Americans' privacy enabled by financial surveillance. Sadly, this isn't the only recent example of the expansion, expansive use of financial surveillance. There are currently efforts to distort the financial system to turn it into a tool to track constitutionally protected behavior, including firearms purchases. Advocates of this approach argue it will help prevent violence, especially mass shootings. To be sure, this is a noble aspiration. However, it is unlikely the effort will accomplish its goal while imposing significant costs to privacy, trust, and the ability of our anti-money laundering system to fulfill its legitimate ends, as well as encouraging a broader escalation of surveillance. As discussed in more detail in my written testimony, our problem is that our financial system provides a convenient, almost one-stop shop where without the constitutional protections that apply to similar information elsewhere. It's too easy for the government to obtain a comprehensive and retrospective, though not perfect, picture of a person's life without due process. A further problem is that the Bank Secrecy Act is opaque by design. Banks are prohibited from alerting the target of a report. This prevents most citizens whose information is shared from challenging the law in court, removing one of the core means we use to check government excesses. Congress has also kept, been kept in the dark about the effectiveness of the BSA, despite requiring reports revealing the system's effectiveness be provided by law. In fact, a bank apparently even refused to share information with the subcommittee based on the Bank Secrecy Act's confidentiality requirements. It even appears that the agencies that administer the BSA and use the BSA lack a full or even partial picture of how the information is used, how useful it is, and how long it takes for government to act on it. We have these problems due to a combination of technology, bad law, and bad Supreme Court precedent. The latter of which, thankfully, may be finally coming under question, but we cannot and should not rely on the court. As discussed further in my written testimony, Congress should reform our financial surveillance system, especially the Bank Secrecy Act, to restore proper protection for Americans' privacy. Importantly, and I want to emphasize this, this does not mean that law enforcement could not access the information. Rather, it means that the access would be done pursuant to due process. To be clear, I'm not here to impugn anyone's motives, but good intentions can pave the road to hell. And our history is unfortunately replete with times when, motivated by real threats, we have violated the rights of Americans, often without benefit, and to our later regret. We should learn from those mistakes and get off the path I fear we're currently taking, which will provide us with neither liberty nor security. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Mr. Tedesco, you are recognized for your opening statement. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, and distinguished members of the Select Subcommittee, good morning, it's an honor to be here. My name is Jeremy Tedesco, and I serve as Senior Counsel and Senior Vice President of Corporate Engagement for Alliance Defending Freedom. Yesterday, this subcommittee released documents that show that the U.S. Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network colluded with big banks to monitor their customers to identify domestic threats and shared a list of so-called hate groups published by the hyperpartisan Institute for Strategic Dialogue to help them do so. Echoing the discredited and morally bankrupt Southern Poverty Law Center, the ISD list includes ADF, where I work, as well as other mainstream religious and conservative organizations like Family Research Council, Liberty Council, Pacific Justice Institute, and Ruth Institute. Simply put, the federal government appears to have swept up Christian and conservative organization, organizations in its domestic terrorist dragnet. This Orwellian surveillance of American citizens has no place in a free society. Neither does the federal government's weaponization of the financial industry against peaceable religious and conservative groups. Our story is just one of many, demonstrating the increased rise and threat of viewpoint-based debanking. In 2023, Bank of America closed the long-standing bank account of Indigenous Advance Ministries, a Christian nonprofit that helps impoverished widows and children in Uganda. The bank also closed the account of a local Tennessee church that donates to that ministry. The bank claimed it no longer wanted to serve their business type and that Indigenous Advance exceeded the bank's risk tolerance. The bank's abrupt decision created a logistical nightmare for Indigenous Advance and inflicted real harm on the populations they serve. The list goes on. J.P. Morgan Chase debanked the Arkansas Family Council for being high risk. 
and never provided a credible reason for canceling the account of former U.S. Senator Samuel Brownback's organization, the National Committee for Religious Freedom. And Wells Fargo denied payment processing to the pro-life group, the Ruth Institute, because it was a hate group. These debanking stories and many more highlight the systemic risk of political and religious bias that pervades the financial industry, particularly at the largest banks and payment processors. These institutions maintain reputational risk policies that allow them unfettered discretion to punish customers who have, in their view, problematic political or religious views. Many also have pro prohibitions on hate speech and intolerance that require the institution to make subjective and value-based judgments on a customer's viewpoint. Both types of policies are vague and ambiguous, sweep in broad swaths of content, chill constitutionally protected speech, and erode economic freedom. Worse, government regulators can all too easily shield their outsized power, I'm sorry, wield their outsized power over financial institutions to pressure them to leverage reputational risk policies, hate speech policies, and similarly vague language against disfavored views, all with virtually no public accountability. Financial institutions, in turn, can hide behind that same shield to discriminate without ever explaining it to the customer, regardless of whether the action was prompted by government pressure. There is ample evidence of the two collaborating to censor views they don't like, whether it was the DOJ and FDIC in Operation Choke Point, the state of New York and NRA versus Vulo, a case currently pending before the Supreme Court, or the FBI and Treasury in recent revelations from this subcommittee. Each of these incidents show that the government can and will weaponize the financial marketplace against Americans for political benefit. Several factors exacerbate this risk. Banking regulators have expansive authority over banks' day-to-day -day operations and decisions. Both the government and banks have shown an unsettling willingness to increase data collection practices around customers' speech and religious exercise. And most banking supervision is shrouded in secrecy. The government props up many of these institutions with bailouts, subsidies, and an anti-competitive chartering system. Due in part to these benefits, the top five banks control 50 over 50% of the market for deposit accounts. This only elevates the need to ensure viewpoint neutrality and the provision of financial services. Congress should take action. This is an issue that we should all agree on and deserves our utmost attention. We cannot continue to let law enforcement, regulators, and banks that are too big to fail run roughshod over our First Amendment freedoms. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Tedesco. Mr. Michelle, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaska, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. I'm Norbert Michelle, Vice President and Director for Cato's Mon Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, and the views that I express today in this testimony are mine. They should not be construed as representing any official position of the Cato Institute. In my testimony, I argue that it is long past the time for Congress to reaffirm Americans' constitutional rights that guarantee an expectation of financial privacy, particularly those secured by the Fourth Amendment. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Bank Secrecy Act and the any money laundering framework that the government has developed around it are unnecessary, wasteful, and harmful. A typical American is not a terrorist, a criminal, or a tax cheat, and does not want to live among such individuals. A typical American does, however, recognize that the Constitution protects all Americans from unreasonable persecution and limitless invasions of privacy. And I'd like to make three main points in support of my position. First, Congress should not have passed the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970. It was a much broader bill than the legislation that its original sponsor promised to deliver, and its relationship to the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution was controversial enough to spur several legal challenges, two of which ended in split decisions at the U.S. Supreme Court during the 1970s. Further, the bill was so controversial that it spurred Congress to pass, pass multiple bills, including the Right to Financial Privacy Act, just eight years after passing the Bank Secrecy Act. It did so with the explicit intent of countering the very financial surveillance that the Bank Secrecy Act itself created. Unfortunately, the 1978 bill was so watered down with 20 different exceptions mm. that it failed to live up to its name. As a result, financial institutions remain responsible for both record keeping and reporting requirements, and law enforcement has the authority to obtain Americans' financial records without first obtaining a valid search warrant. The so-called third-party doctrine 
born largely out of those Supreme Court decisions in the 1970s, excuses this legal status by effectively claiming that bank customers have no expectation of privacy from the government once they give their information to the bank. Much like the dissenting justices of those cases, I believe this logic defies all reasoning. There is simply no sphere of our lives that would remain free of government involvement, surveillance, and control if it were taken seriously. Second, the agencies themselves have failed to demonstrate how the Bank Secrecy Act regime provides a net benefit, and it has merely created an information overload for federal agencies through excessive reporting. In 2022, for instance, financial institutions were required to file over 26 million reports with the federal government on customer activity. And even though it's been decades since the first suspicious activity report was filed, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network still cannot provide data that explains how law enforcement even uses those reports. These two points are just the tip of the iceberg. Difficult as it may be to believe, there are virtually no convictions to show for all this regulating and reporting. Depending on the federal crime data that we use, the per conviction cost ranges anywhere from $7 million to $178 million. And those figures do not include any implicit cost of violating citizens' right to financial privacy, banks' decisions to terminate or limit customers' accounts, or banks' refusal to provide financial services to certain customers. Finally, personal and financial privacy are pillars of life in a free society. The American system of government was designed with good reason to ensure that individuals do enjoy a private sphere free of government involvement, surveillance, and control. Unless there is a reasonable suspicion that someone has committed a crime or conspired to commit a crime, people should generally be free to live their lives unmolested and unsurveilled by the government. That is literally why the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution protects Americans from unreasonable searches and seizures. And Americans' financial records should not be an exception to that rule. It is, of course, healthy to debate what private companies should be allowed to do with the data they collect from customers. But no American should confuse that debate with why we have the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment protects us from unwarranted government persecution. And that is why Congress should amend the Bank Secrecy Act and restore Americans' Fourth Amendment rights. Thank you, I welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Michel. Uh, we now go to Mr. Fanon for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to answer questions regarding the events that occurred at the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021. I would like to tell you <clears throat> that I've forgotten some of the events of that day or that my recollection is not as clear as it once was, but that would not be the truth. The events of January 6th are as vivid to me now as when they occurred over three years ago. While the physical scars of that day have healed, the emotional scars remain. We are a government of laws, not of men. I spent nearly two decades as a law enforcement officer trying to enforce the law. My career began in the United States Capitol as a Capitol Police officer and ended when called upon as a Metropolitan Police officer to protect the Capitol against a mob of people. While much of my career involved dangerous encounters with violent criminals, that experience was unlike anything I had experienced. <clears throat> I'm here to tell you <clears throat> what happened to me on that day and what I saw and heard happening to fellow officers. As for me, I was violently grabbed, restrained, beaten, tased, all while being called a traitor to my country. I was at risk of being stripped of and killed with my own firearm as I heard chants of kill him with his own gun. My body camera video captured the violence of the crowd directed towards me during those very brutal moments. The portions of the video I have seen remain extremely painful for me to watch, but doing so is crucial to fully understand what really happened that day and the extent of the violence. During those moments, I remember thinking that there was a good chance that I could be killed, and my thoughts were of my children who may lose their father. While I'm here to share my experience, I know that hundreds of other law enforcement officers responded that day, 
They were outnumbered and acted with tremendous bravery to protect the Capitol and all those present inside who serve our country. Those officers have sustained injuries, both physical and emotional. They too have been scarred, some visible and some that cannot be seen. I think of them often, like my partner, Jimmy Albright, who dragged me to safety while I was unconscious and who drove me to the emergency room, though injured himself. I think then about Commander Ramey Kyle, who like so many of us self-deployed to the Capitol, who organized the defense of the Lower West Terrace Tunnel, his rally cry, do not give up the door, <clears throat> echoes through my thoughts. I think of all the brave men and women, newly minted officers and those nearly retired who responded to the call of service that day in defense of our nation. Those who are still on the front lines each and every day to make our city safe and protect our institutions of government. I appear today not to give my opinion or analysis or advocate for some action, but simply to bear witness. I leave whatever actions to be taken to your wisdom. <clears throat> and where we go as a, as a nation to the American people. I have no agenda or affiliation. I do not come with malice in my heart, but only a deep love of this country, which I know is shared by so many others, both young and old, both Republican and Democrat. And in the process of speaking, more importantly, listening to each other, hopefully we can come together as one nation with shared values of wanting to, tomorrow to be better than today, with the hope and confidence that we do each and every day, <clears throat> excuse me, is for the singular purpose of trying to provide a better life for our children and our children's children in generations to come. I thank you for your invitation to be here today and the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fennell. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fennell, I, I want to express my heartfelt thank you for being here today. Those of us who were here on January 6th, uh, in no small part owe you and others a debt of of gratitude for the work you did uh, ushering people into uh, members of Congress and others into safety. Uh, and I, I truly appreciate that and thank you. Thank you, sir. If this were only about January 6th, that would have been my last comment and we'd be done. I'm gonna ask a series of questions that I think beg the question of, of something beyond January 6th. For all of you, if you'd raise your hand, are there any of you who think that it would be better if we had the same rules of discovery that China, Cuba, Russia, Iran have from a standpoint of looking for criminals among us? Is there anyone here that would raise their hand? I thought not. For all of you, let's ask some questions, uh, and I'll use Mr. Tedesco as, uh, as my straw man for a moment. With the way the Bank Secrecy Act has been used, is there anything that stops an administration from choosing to look at and gather, strip away and get from the major banks or all the banks, all the data of all the citizens and participants in our society. In other words, simply haul it all in so they have a database for whatever they need to do, whether it's January 6th or, uh, you know, somebody driving in town uh, and, and not paying a parking ticket. Sure. I don't know the Bank Secrecy Act particularly well. I know the First Amendment implications of the way in which I'm really regulate. looking at the Fourth Amendment for a moment. Sure. Uh, you know, Again, for the others, uh, Mr. Knight, I think you answered on this. Really, there's nothing that would stop an administration in secret from taking vast amounts, potentially all of it, uh, under current law. Uh, the only qu question you'd really ask is, can you later go to court and say it was excessive and would the court side with you? But from a functional standpoint, what they ask for at the FBI, they get. Is that correct? I believe that's correct, Representative. In fact, I, I think it's even worse than that in the sense that it doesn't necessarily need to be evidence of a crime. It could be evidence of some other violation, uh, you know, a non-criminal violation. 
And also, because the target of a suspicious activity report is prohibited from finding out, it would actually be very hard for the person to go to court later and challenge it unless they were the subject potentially of a prosecution, in which case you're already starting behind the eight ball. Okay, so as we stand right now, the Fourth Amendment relative to your banking records, which don't just say what you spent money on, it says where you were, because by definition, when you put that credit card into the gas pump, we know exactly where you were. So there's nothing that stops government from finding out not only what you're spending on, but where you are and what you're doing. Is that correct? Uh, sir, that's absolutely correct. Um, and the, the reason for that is from the court's perspective, those records aren't yours. They belong to the bank and therefore you have no protectable privacy right in them. But the court recently has been starting to change their thinking on that type of thing. Well, and we're, we're hoping to uh, spur the court to think more uh, through legislation. Uh, summarizing though, we're talking mostly about bank records because those are the ones that we have a current example. But isn't it true that the FBI and other agencies want the same access to all of your phone records, which would include where you are moment by moment and who you talk to? Is that correct? Well, yes, that was an issue in the Carpenter case where, the, where law enforcement tried to pull location data from cell phone towers and the court found that uh, customers have a protectable Fourth Amendment right, even though those records belong to the co phone company, not to the customer. So in closing, for, for everyone here, if I want to get those kinds of records on the FBI, in the case of your phone records, for all practical purposes, with there are exigent circumstance exceptions, but for all practical purposes, you need to get a warrant. You don't need it for bank records, but isn't it true that those records very often provide the same information and thus are equally invasive into not just your First Amendment, but your Fourth Amendment, reasonable expectation for privacy and the, the keeping of your uh, files and personal effects? I would argue they're potentially more sensitive and can provide more accurate information than cell phone towers. Well, uh, I for one would close by saying that I don't see a problem getting warrants. I don't see a problem getting judges. And this committee has a significant role with FISA and other uh, cases like that. The question is, will we amend law so that no matter where the data is being grabbed by the government, it's being grabbed pursuant to a reasonable expectation that you have a reason to get it and a judge who agrees. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for their willingness to testify before the committee. As evidenced by today's hearing, the singular mission of this so-called subcommittee on weaponization and the House Republican leadership appears to be the proliferation or, ironically, the weaponization of false narratives for political purposes. Combined with the rudderless efforts to develop evidence for the impeachment of President Biden, these proceedings have become increasingly bizarre at every turn. You know, once upon a time, we were told that the key to all of this was the Hunter Biden laptop. That was the smoking gun that would solve all of this. Until then, it wasn't. Then it was getting Hunter Biden to testify. That was going to be the conclusive evidence until at one point he had the courage to walk into a hearing, sit in the front row, and then all of a sudden Republicans rejected his offer to testify publicly and instead voted to hold him in contempt. Then it was going to be the testimony of the Republicans' top legal expert witnesses who were going to appear before Congress and offer evidence against President Biden and lay out the legal theory to justify articles of impeachment. But they showed up all of them with great resumes, but, but with no evidence. And they testified under oath, under oath, that they could not find any evidence that would support or suggest such charges. And finally, last month, the Trump-appointed special counsel, David Weiss, announced that he had indicted Chairman Jim Jordan's star witness, former FBI informant Alexander Smirnov for making false statements and fabricating evidence to federal investigators about President Biden and his family. 
including the shameless lie that President Biden sought millions in bribes from Ukrainian energy company Burisma when he served as vice president. Now Smirnov, some of you may not remember, but Smirnov is the guy that Chairman Jordan described, and I'll give you a quote, the chairman's quote, as providing, quote, the most corroborating evidence the Republicans have, close quote, in support of impeachment. So given that Smirnov is being charged by the Republican Trump-appointed special counsel for lying and fabricating evidence, and the pathetic show that the Republicans have put on so far, that assessment is probably correct. He's probably the best they've got. Now the chairman of this subcommittee is determined to obscure the facts surrounding January 6th. Today's hearing appears to be based on the false narrative that conservative Americans and even Bible pur purchases are the targets of pervasive and baseless financial surveillance by the federal government. It also follows statements made by several House members downplaying the attacks that Officer Fanon has, has described at the U.S. Capitol complex as, quote, acts of vandalism, close quote, and a normal tourist visit. That could not be further from the truth. As reported by the Bipartisan Select Committee on January 6th in its final report, our nation endured an insurrection that specifically sought to violently block congressional certification of the 2020 presidential election. The sheer scale of the mob violence that you saw on the video earlier and the lawlessness that was exhibited that day tested the very fabric of our democracy with rioters savagely beating law enforcement officers like Officer Fanon amid repeated crowd chants such as hang Mike Pence, shoot him with his own gun. The Republican vice president, hang Mike Pence. That's what makes you an extremist. That's what makes you a terrorist. Not, not just your, your desire to purchase under the Second Amendment a, a, a weapon that you're legally entitled to have. It also warranted additional investigatory, investigatory efforts by federal law enforcement authorities to prevent more violence leading up to the 2021 presidential inauguration. Officer Fanon, as a former Metropolitan Police officer, could you please tell us how the promulgation of false narratives, like this was just a tourist visit or simple vandalism, how that distorted description affects your ability to do your, do your job? Thank you for the question. Well, <clears throat> essentially, um, the distortions, mischaracterizations, and lies about uh, January 6th uh, resulted in, um, or at least partially played a role in me leaving my job as a Metropolitan Police Officer. Um, they have inspired fellow Americans to uh, threaten me, uh, threaten members of my family simply because of uh, the statements that I've made about my experience uh, both on January 6, 2021 and uh, in the aftermath. Um, so. well, well, thank you very much. Uh, my time has expired. Mr. So, Chairman, I have a unanimous Mr. consent Fon request. No, I would uh, thank you for your service. Gentleman yields back. A unanimous consent request, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman may state her request. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a January 7, 2021 email from the FBI to financial institutions requesting information about Edward Florea because he, quote, claimed to be armed and intending to travel to D.C. to unleash, quote, some violence. No I also ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a press release from the Eastern District of New York announcing Edward Florea's sentencing for making threats to kill elected officials like Senator Raphael Warnock entitled, quote, Queen's man sentenced to 33 months in prison for posting threats to kill a member of Congress and illegally possessing am ammunition, uh, unquote. Without objection. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it's just, sit, just sitting up here listening to y'all's testimony. It's just absolutely insane the level of the deep state acting to go after pro-life groups, pro-gun groups that you, Mr. Tedesco, taught, the Arkansas pro-life group that now they can't even bank at the bank that they were banking at because of their political beliefs. Um, the information that the chairman put up about people purchasing religious texts and firearms, um, all without a warrant. 
I mean, you know, you go to law school and they teach you constitutional law and the Fourth Amendment and all these things that have to happen in order for the government to get information about you or to search your information. And all of this is happening without even the person knowing that it's going on, without a warrant, without an ability to even to defend themselves. In the aftermath of the 2020 presidential election, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, at the U.S. Department of Treasury told major banks to be on the lookout for customers using credit and debit cards for the purchase of legal firearms. As a gun owner and a strong proponent of our Second Amendment rights, it's appalling that a federal agency would ask private companies to spy on their customers conducting perfectly legal business transactions. It's not like there's a suspicion of criminality going on. These are just typical purchases of firearms. FinCEN also passed along a report to several large banks titled Bankrolling Bigotry, an overview of the online funding strategies of American hate groups. Included among those supposed hate groups is the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is represented before us today by Mr. Tedesco. I found this characterization curious because the ADF that I know is anything but a hate group. ADF defends Americans' God-given right to religious liberty in courts around this country, but it seems the Biden administration views advocacy for religious liberty as hate these days. That says far more about the administration than it does about ADF. President Obama once infamously remarked that many conservative Americans cling to guns or religion, and given FinCEN's actions, it seems that President Biden's administration shares the same hostility for millions of Americans like me who proudly cling to our First and Second Amendment rights. Mr. Tedesco, what's your reaction to your organization being identified as a hate group in a report shared by a government agency? It's unbelievable that that is being used by the federal government to advise banks on domestic terrorist threats. But you know, I think the bigger point here is that the concept of hate is a tool of suppre suppression. And on top of that, that kind of language, hate speech and, and similar kinds of vague <laughs> concepts are permeated throughout the financial industry and are used to shut down events and to debank people. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase has used it several times. Arkansas Family Policy, they said it was high risk. They shut down a, an event by defense of, uh, defense of Liberty. On behalf of Donald Trump Jr. was speaking at it. They shut down that event uh, on the basis of a hate policy. So we know these policies are being weaponized in the financial industry. And again, because of the Bank Secrecy Act and a lot of the shrouding of the way regulation happens in the banking context, it's really hard to know why are these things happening? We just know it's on the rise, and it's a real concern. Well, and, w and one of my colleagues was just saying that this is just a narrative that we're creating, uh, a political narrative. But you've gone through specifics. I, I, if, if you want to, highlight specifically some of these instances that you're referring to of facts where pro-life groups or organizations that are conservative have been debanked by these uh, private entities. Sure, the highest profile one is, is a former member of uh, the, the Senate, Samuel Brownback's organization, National Committee for Religious Freedom. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase canceled that account in 2022. Um, they gave an escalating and very different reasons um, that were contradictory over the next year as scrutiny mounted. None of the reasons ever held any weight. Um, interestingly enough, they, they uh, referred to anti-money laundering, financing of terrorism, a concept called politically exposed persons. All of these are within the banking regulations um, and I think are used as tools ultimately to suppress people because of their views. Um, again, the secrecy and the shrouding of the reasons for the decisions is a huge part of the problem. And I think that's something Congress needs to address. And is there circumstances in which the, the consumers may never know that their information was privately disclosed from the bank to the FBI or a government agency? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge part of the problem is our clients, uh, you know, to a, to a person, anytime they go to the bank, once they get debanked, it's always under some vague policy. The only thing the bank will say is high risk or business type or risk tolerance. Every time they go back and ask for an, e an answer, a specific reason, the bank just stonewalls them. And, and so I, they can't get access to the information. I only have a couple seconds left. So what is your recourse if you do find out? So let's say, because I basically ticked a lot of those boxes that were referenced, firearms, Bibles, religious texts. So if you do find out that your information was divulged from the bank that you bank to a government agency, do you have any recourse whatsoever to go after the government or the bank? It's difficult for consumers who are in that position because they usually don't know it happens. If it happens, there are consumer complaints you can file with state attorneys general. Um, there's probably other avenues that people could pursue, but I think that's oh, part will. of the reason why Congress should act to uh, 
you know, cordon off some of the, um, um, the secrecy and confidentiality that's happening in the banking industry and also affirmatively require banks to stop using reputational risk in some of these other vague categories to determine whether they're going to bank with someone. Thank you all for being here today. Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. I thank the chair. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the FBI's situation report sent to financial institutions with respect to an explicit and clear threat on January 16, 2021, with respect to the inauguration. I thank the chair. LA from California is recognized. Thank you. Um, I thank our witnesses for being here. And I want to examine <laughs> some of the actual requests that the FBI sent to financial institutions in the wake of the violence that occurred on January 6, 2021. Not the overly broad groups that my Republican colleagues are purposely trying to scare Americans into believing that are being surveilled every single day without any crime prevention or crime solving purpose in mind. On January 14, 2021, the FBI asked financial institutions for information about Robert Corey Lemke, who made, quote, interstate threats of violence targeting the family of a U.S. congressman, as well as other in, further in furtherance of anti-government, anti-authority extremism. And I would ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the uh, email dated January 14, 2021, from FBI employee to financial institutions into the record. Lemke ultimately pleaded guilty and was sentenced to three years in prison for making threatening interstate communications against co members of Congress and journalists in connection with the 2020 election. He sent threatening electronic and audio messages to approximately 50 victims he targeted because of their statements about Donald Trump losing the 2020 presidential election. He sent messages to a New York City congressman's brother threatening him and the brother's children. He sent messages to the family of a journalist, and I would ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the press release entitled California Man Sentenced to Three Years in Prison for Making Threats Against Political Officials and Journalists Relating to the Outcome of the 2020 Presidential Election. Without objection. Um, Officer Fanon, in your experience, is it appropriate for law enforcement to use all lawfully available tools in the investigation of somebody who's threatening the family of members of public officials or journalists? Uh, yes, ma'am. It's not only appropriate, it's uh, law enforcement's responsibility to do so. Would it be a dereliction of duty if you didn't use every lawfully available tool to you to try to prevent a crime from happening or to solve a crime that has already happened? Uh, yes, ma'am, I believe so. Thank you. The day before the inauguration, the FBI requested information about Samuel Fisher, who was photographed on the steps of the U.S. Capitol and is suspected of unlawfully entering federal property on January 6, 2021. The FBI noted that Fisher may also have been, quote, manufacturing trafficking guns in preparation for civil war. Additionally, Fisher espouses racially motivated and anti-government extremist ideology, end quote. The FBI noted that it was, quote, currently preparing enforcement action and is interested in financial information that corroborates Fisher's involvement in firearms tracking. And I would ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the email from FBI employee to financial institutions about this matter into the record. Without objection. Um, Officer Fanon, why might law enforcement agencies seek financial information in cases of arms trafficking? Well, I mean, outside of the obvious that um, potential receipts or uh, purchases made would uh, provide evidence that, uh, in fact, the weapons were purchased by a specific individual. Uh, my understanding is, you know, within these particular requests, uh, it was the FBI seeking voluntary compliance um, from a number of banking institutions uh, in which their ask was, was very specific in that they were looking for individuals who were present on January 6th, which I think we can all uh, agree was an incredibly violent uh, assault against law enforcement officers, uh, those individuals that also had purchased firearms within the past six months uh, and uh, were, or at least there was evidence to support they were planning on returning to the nation's capital uh, on January 20th. So they, they weren't just looking for people based on their beliefs. There were three different criteria that they were using that all had to be present in order to do this search. Is that correct? 
Oh, that's my understanding, yes. Right. Samuel Fisher, by the way, was arrested the very next day, and when he was arrested, FBI agents found over 1,000 rounds of ammunition and several weapons, including an illegally modified AR-15 rifle and machetes in his Upper East Side apartment and his car. Fisher, by the way, wrote after the Capitol riot, quote, seeing cops literally run was the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life, end quote, and I would ask unanimous consent to insert into the record that New York Times article entitled Dating Coach Charged in Capital Riot Gets Prison Term for Gun Crime into the record. This is a clear example of people committing criminal acts that my colleagues across the aisle are claiming are the victims, the innocent victims of surveillance. But in reality, the FBI was doing their job. They were working to prevent threats to the inauguration and to hold January 6th rioters responsible for their criminal actions. Officer Fanone, I want to thank you for being here today, and I appreciate your willingness to bear witness to what really happened on January 6th, 2021, and just to dispel these overly broad, fear-mongering tactics that innocent Americans are being surveilled simply because of their beliefs or their religion. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, the gentleman yields here, back. Here. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Yield to Mr. Jordan. Uh, I think the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Knight, do you need a gun registration list if government can ju just go ask the banks every time some customer purchases a gun? Well, the banks won't know if you purchased a gun per se, but your bank records can be a, red a pretty good, though not perfect, registration for almost anything. But my point is it's almost like a backdoor registration, right? Yes, it, it, one, of our, one of the challenges is that information, highly sensitive information can be accessed through financial records that otherwise is constitutionally protected. Yeah. Dr. Peterson, do you think, uh, do you think they're just gonna stop, uh, stop with conservatives? I mean, my, my, my history tells us that the cancel culture mob, the, the surveillance state, whatever you wanna call it, it doesn't just, it, they never are satisfied with just certain people, it, it always expands. And I'll give you an example. A few years ago, uh, senator Feinstein, iconic Democrat senator from the great state of California, uh, the folks in San Francisco renamed the Diane Feinstein Elementary School. They took her name off the school because they found that she said something like 40 years ago that the cancel culture mob didn't like. So even a liberal Democrat senator wasn't good enough for the mob. They came after her too. And this is, this is the thing that scares me. We've invited probably more Democrat witnesses in front of this committee than any other committee. Because we invite Democrats to come in and say, we respect the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, respect the Constitution. My concern is it never just stops with certain people. It always goes further. Do you agree with that? Well, the reason I preface my remarks with an insistence on nonpartisanship is because the danger posed by this increasing ability of governments and large corporations to collude threatens everyone's freedom equally. And it could well be that at the moment, and this is, I think, the case the Republican, Republicans here are trying to make, is that the people who are in the sights of that collusion tend to have more conservative leanings. But that will shift in a moment when, whenever the political tides shift. And we're, we're concentrating in this hearing a fair bit on the specific events of January 6th, a very partisan um, issue that produces a very intense partisan divide. But we're not addressing the we're not addressing the fundamental issue here directly, which is that our new technology enables a mode of surveillance that's so intense and all-pervading that no one will escape its purview regardless of their political views. No, I, I, I think that's exactly right. And there also seems to me, and I'll go to Mr. Tedesco, there seems to be a, a pattern emerging. I'm gonna take you back to when we first kind of started getting into this issue with the somewhat famous now school board's memorandum from the Department of Justice. And I, I know you probably remember what I'm talking about here, Mr. Tedesco. But the opening sentence of the Attorney General's uh, document, this memorandum, says, in recent months, there's been a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, threats of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, staff, and who participate in the vital work of running our nation's public schools. At the hearing where we had the Attorney General, I asked him a simple question. I said, you make that opening statement as the basis for why you need this, this, this memorandum to go after moms and dads showing up at school board meetings. What was that first sentence based on? And he told us it was based on the National School Boards Association, the memorandum they put out. And the same thing happened to you guys because we had some entity here called the, what, the Global Disinformation Index puts out this 
information, and then the government uses that information as the basis to say you're some terrorist group. That is frightening. That our government, because FinCEN, the Treasury Department, used what some agency put out, or not agency, some entity put out as the basis to say you guys are some hate group or some terrorist group. Yep. I find that alarming, and particularly the pattern that it, I guess two doesn't make a pattern, but it sure makes you start to wonder. Your well, thoughts, the F Mr. Tedesco? Sure, the FBI used the SPLC's report on radical traditional Catholics to target them exactly. as well in the interim between the, the, the Moms for Liberty and parental rights groups and, uh, and what's going on today. I think it's very alarming that the government uses these obviously partisan and discredited third party, you know, arbiters of truth uh, who really are just promoting their own political agenda and trying to do damage to their perceived political enemies um, to make decisions about anything, let alone sending them to financial institutions as part of some kind of financial, financial surveillance scheme. Yeah. Some left-wing group says, you're, you're bad. Oh, oh, then the government's gonna use that information to send out to banks and say, you might wanna be concerned about this. You maybe wanna debank these individuals. That is a frightening world. And the point is, I don't think it's gonna be just limited to conservative people in the future. Because we've already seen examples, there were, there were people in Black Lives Matter who got targeted during the summer of 2020 when all the protests were happening around the country. And I disagree with some of the things, a lot of the things that happened that summer, but I also don't like the fact that they're going after liberals either. That, that is, that's a scary thing. And then there used to be an agreement in both parties that First Amendment activity should be protected. Second Amendment activity, your right to privacy should be protected. But unfortunately now it's gotten way too partisan. Uh, with that, we will go to the other yes, side. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For nearly 20 years in this chamber, I, I know I've heard time and again Republicans claim that they back the blue. Just recently, Chairman Jordan put out a press release around the Law Enforcement Appreciation Day resolution, which said when it comes to supporting the police, quote, Republicans put words into action, unquote. Yet when it comes to walking that walk, Republicans too often take a seat. Just yesterday, we took a vote on a bipartisan spending bill that includes funding for our criminal justice programs. Of the Republicans that make up this committee, a handful of you voted against it. That, of course, would mean less funding for state and local law enforcement agencies and more criminals on our streets and in our neighborhoods. That no vote means no funding for the Internet Crimes Against Children program, a key law enforcement tool that keeps online predators away from our children. Those actions sure don't back the blue. And now today, Republicans want to target law enforcement yet again. This time, they purposefully downplay the heinous violence that injured and traumatized hundreds of Capitol Police officers in the January 6th insurrection, perhaps the most infamous assault on law enforcement in recent American history. Specifically, our Republican colleagues are taking aim at the ability to use financial records as a tool to prosecute the coup plotters, the criminals, who attempted to stop the legitimate constitutional transfer of power in Congress. These are the very financial tools that help hold to account the people who tried to overthrow a presidential election. Officer, no Officer Fanon, thank you so much for repeatedly testifying about your experiences. I'm sure it isn't easy, as you mentioned, to relive these traumatic moments. Could you describe some of the violence briefly that Capitol Police officers were subjected to on January 6th? Certainly. So, <clears throat> uh, I, like many other officers uh, from the Metropolitan Police Department, uh, self-deployed de that day uh, in that um, I heard distress calls coming out from uh, officers who were already deployed at the Capitol complex uh, and took it upon myself to respond uh, to those calls um, for assistance. Uh, when I arrived at the Capitol, uh, I made my way to uh, the, uh, what's referred to as the Lower West Terrace Tunnel uh, in response to a specific distress call coming from uh, officers that were defending that tunnel ag against a uh, large group of uh, violent rioters that were trying to gain access. Um, Thank you. When, when I entered the tunnel, I observed uh, about 40 or 50 uh, D.C. police officers and a few U.S. Capitol police officers uh, attempting to hold back uh, the violent mob. Uh, the officers were being assaulted with a variety of different weapons, uh, everything from uh, metal poles, two-by-fours, uh, aluminum baseball bats, 
uh, batons and, and uh, other police equipment that had been stripped from uh, police officers themselves were, were then used against officers. Thank you, Officer uh, Fanon. Thank you. I'm sorry. I want to oh. just make sure I can get some other items in. Um, I, I, the video that we saw earlier was disturbing. In a video that I don't have time to show, you can hear words like traitor being yelled at police officers and shouts like F the blue. Five police officers who served at the Capitol died in the aftermath of the insurrection. Officer Fanon, what's your response to those who say that no police officers were killed by the events on January 6, 2021? Uh, well, my thoughts on Officer Brian Sicknick. Uh, obviously, um, Brian Sicknick's cause of death um, was ruled unrelated to the Capitol riot. Um, that being said, I think that good, um, decent people uh, would understand that uh, if it were not for his participation in the defense of this Capitol on January 6th against a violent mob, uh, Brian Sicknick would be here with us today. Um, I understand, I think, better than most the um, post-traumatic stress that accompanied uh, my participation uh, in defending the Capitol on January 6th and then enduring the mischaracterization or lies uh, about what I experienced that day from people in positions of power, uh, many of whom were here at the Capitol themselves. Um, I, um, I understand what brought many officers to uh, um, taking their own lives and um, I, I certainly attribute uh, their actions uh, to uh, their participation in, in defense of uh, the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and my Republican colleagues, once again, I ask that you stop trivializing the violent assault the entire world saw that day, both to our democracy and to our law enforcement. And please do not cavalierly discard financial information as a law enforcement tool to prevent the next January 6th. The necessity of making this tool for law enforcement is even more imperative considering the presidential candidate you support all but promises yet another assault, violent or otherwise, on our sacred democracy. And I yield back. General um, General Mr. Chairman, back. before you go to the next member, if I can ask again for a unanimous consent request. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the FBI's situation report sent to financial institutions on January 13, 2021, which explains in the middle of page two the exact kind of threats that the FBI was trying to prevent leading up to the inauguration that day. These were threats to murder members of Congress and start a shooting at the inauguration, the exact type of threats the FBI is responsible for, for investigating. And I quote, on 8 January, information was received regarding a video posted on an identified website encouraging people to kill senators and Congress members. The poster of the video was identified via social media exploitation. The video was threatening violence in Washington, D.C. on Inauguration Day and advised people to bring guns. With, without objection. We want the FBI to do their job. We just want them to do it in a way consistent with the Constitution. With that, I recognize the gentlelady from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Knight, thank you for your testimony today. In 2022, gun ban activists, amalgamated bank, and far-left politicians pushed for the creation of an unconstitutional merchant category code to be assigned to firearms retailers to identify, quote, suspect purchases and report purchasing patterns to law enforcement, a clear unconstitutional infringement on Second Amendment rights, and a clear backdoor to a gun registry. In fact, failed New York Attorney General Tish James specifically mentioned the importance of labeling gun and ammunition sales as a way to indicate an imminent crime. Since then, some states have banned the code, while states like California have mandated it to surveil Americans' purchases. This is why I introduced the Protecting Privacy in Purchases Act with Congressman Barr and Hudson to put a stop to this code and protect law-abiding Americans from this infringing unconstitutional overreach. Can you explain how does this code threaten Americans' privacy and constitutional rights? Thank you very much. This code, and if we were to do similar codes for other sensitive issues, risks uh, creating a raft of false positives where individuals who are potentially engaging in Second Amendment activity, because it's important to know that the MCC doesn't tell you what people buy, it just tells you where they buy it, right? 
will be reported to the government as potentially suspicious for no real basis, um, or, or at least not a basis that, that is, is likely to be reasonable. Um, and that's gonna create a database that is available um, that could be searched later. One of the dangerous things about this financial um, database is that, or the, this, these financial records is that they're retrospective. Um, and even perhaps you know, just as bad is that there's precious little reason to believe it would be effective at its stated goal for a host of reasons I can get into if you want. Yes, please expand. Okay, so the problem here is that you won't know what someone buys. You're expecting banks to correctly identify what is really a hallmark of violence. Um, you're expecting them to report it promptly. You're expecting law enforcement to then act on it promptly and effectively. And so I'd like to point to, you know, I don't know if they'd like me pointing to it, but uh, Guns Down America has a report that advocates the MCC, but if you look at the examples they point to as possible examples where this could have helped, it's hard to believe they, they would, either because there's such a short time frame, 12 days, there's, there's a reason to believe, I don't see why we believe that, that uh, you know, 12 days would be enough time for law enforcement to act on it, because we don't know how fast it takes the government to use any SARS, or there's actually, it's hard to actually differentiate suspicious activity from legitimate activity. Rather, they look at cases and then work backwards. So we don't know what the denominator is. We don't know how many false positives there will be. Also, in the, the recent report, when we look at the key bank uh, methodology, it's very, very broad. It's very over-inclusive. And it has, its thresholds are such that it's far more than you need to spend to commit a horrible act of violence but less than you'd spend to get a good hunting rifle and scope. And so how, how confident should we be that we're gonna actually get more noise than, or signal than noise? I don't believe we should be. Given how little we know about uh, how SARS are treated as is, I think we should be deeply skeptical. And do you believe this is a backdoor to a gun registry? I believe it's a back, I believe some of its supporters view it as a backdoor to discourage firearms purchases. Well, in my district in upstate New York and Americans across this country are proud uh, to stand up for our constitutional rights and understand this is an infringement on our constitutional rights. Why is my bill so important? What's his point? <laughs> well, ma'am, um, I, I think that efforts to, efforts to restrict the collection of data at the bank level are the best option we have currently because under current law, unless we can reform the BSA, once the bank has that data, government has that data. So preventing the, the, the uh, collection at the bank level is your first best option. Thank you very much, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm gonna yield my time to the ranking member, but I just wanted to uh, say to Officer Fanon, um, I was on the House floor on January 6th. Uh, we haven't had a chance to talk, but I know you have kids. I have, my wife is at home with our son Jordan, who wasn't yet two. She was seven months pregnant. Uh, and, you know, thanks to your bravery, the bravery of your colleagues, uh, and of true patriots who defended this capital, I believe I got to meet my son Cameron. So I want to thank you for your service. Thank you for your bravery. I'm sorry that you've had to endure so much of this personal attacks uh, to try and undermine what you actually did that day. But I want you to know that people all across this country know what you did, respect you, and appreciate your service. So thank you. I, I yield to the ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Allred. I believe we all share those sentiments. Um, I want to say that this is not a partisan issue. Uh, I heard it said that January 6th is a partisan issue. I, I just want to read something. A mob was assaulting the Capitol in his name. These criminals were carrying his banners, hanging his flags, and screaming their loyalty to him. It was obvious that only President Trump could end this. Former aides publicly begged him to do so. Loyal allies frantically called the administration. But the president did not act swiftly. He did not do his job. He didn't take steps so federal law could be faithfully executed and order restored. Instead, according to public reports, he watched television happily as the chaos unfolded. He kept pressing his scheme to overturn the election. Even after it was clear to any reasonable observer that Vice President Pence was in danger, 
even as the mob carrying Trump banners were beating cops and breaching perimeters, the president sent a further tweet attacking his vice president. Predictably and foreseeably under the circumstances, members of the mob seems to interpret this as a further inspiration to lawlessness and violence. That was the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell. This is not partisan. And the reason we kept saying this is about January 6th is because it is about January 6th. They're trying to expand the scope of what the FBI was trying to do. It was not to invade all Americans' bank records. It was not about a violation of the Fourth Amendment against search and seizure. I'm a, I've been a practitioner of the law, not just a law professor, not just someone with a graduate degree from law school, but a prosecutor, an investigator, and you use the tools that you have to prevent crimes from happening. Because guess what? I've shopped in a Bass Pro Shop plenty of times. I read the Bible on a regular basis. I happen to be in my family, happen to be gun owners. But I'm not afraid that the FBI is going to be searching my account because I was also not a rioter on January 6th. And I did not purchase a gun in the last six months before the inauguration and make plans to come back to attempt to again stop the free and fair election of our government. It's getting ridiculous. Officer Fanon, Fanon, so sorry. Officer Fanon, you saw the violence on January 6, 2021. And you saw the individuals, you were up close and way too personal with many of them. You also, unlike many of the people here, attended hearings, trials, and sentencing of many of those individuals. Based upon the knowledge that you have, that many of us here on this dais do not, do you know what ideology the January 6 rioters embraced? And how do you, if you do, how do you know that? I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I can't speak to every single individual that was there that day at the Capitol. Uh, I didn't have an opportunity to interview them. I was too busy fighting for my life. Uh, that being said, uh, I was present uh, at a number of the sentencing hearings regarding individuals that were specifically uh, charged with and later pled guilty to uh, violent assaults of uh, myself and, and other officers. And many of those individuals, um, in their plea for uh, leniency to the judge at sentencing, uh, cited the fact that they had been inspired by um, and uh, by rhetoric used by the former president, um, by misinformation from news media outlets that led them to believe that the 2020 election had been stolen uh, and that it was their patriotic duty to in fact um, respond to the Capitol that day and fight to save their country. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman lady yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for five minutes. We began this hearing by reciting a Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to begin my questioning by reciting the Fourth Amendment, because I think the other side of the aisle has kind of forgot some of the terms that are in there. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. This is in our Constitution. Mr. Michelle, can you tell us how the Bank Secrecy Act and exemptions to the Right to Financial Privacy Act may not be in compliance with the Fourth Amendment, or how the implementation of those acts may violate the Fourth Amendment? Sure, uh, much like Brian Knight uh, alluded to a minute ago, once the bank or a financial institution has the information, the government has it. So uh, this came up in the early Supreme Court, or in the early court challenges, it came up in the Supreme Court cases uh, that eventually, those cases eventually went to the Supreme Court. 
in that you have effect, we effectively have a law that is a blank check for the federal government or for law enforcement to obtain all of your information simply without a warrant. So without probable cause? They do not have to get a warrant. They do not have to show probable cause to get the warrant. They, do they have to they give have an oath or affirmation <laughs> no. to a judge? No. Uh, no. They have to go to the bank. Yeah. So it's, it seems to me that these, uh, these acts, they're not just uh, out of date, but they're outside of the Constitution. Um, Mr. Knight, you began your opening statement by characterizing some of the things that the government could know or infer about you based on how you spend your money. Could you elaborate on that or reiterate? What, what are the things that government can know or infer based on purchasing habits? Government can know almost everything about you with a relatively high degree of confidence. They know where you live. They can figure out where you work. They can figure out potentially things like your sexual orientation, they can figure out, or at least have a high degree of, not of, of you know, accuracy in guessing what your interests are. They can figure out, or have a high degree in guessing what your religion is, what you know, political beliefs you support, and they can fig, you know, potentially figure out, or at least have a better than average chance of knowing whether or not you own a firearm. They can also potentially know if you've had an abortion. And it's worth noting that after the Dobbs decision, there was a lot of concern raised about the sensitivity of medical information that would be available under the Bank Secrecy Act in a state that prohibits or severely restricts abortion. And so I just really want to drive home the point that this is not a left or right thing or an R or D thing. This is a situation where everyone has sensitive information that is potentially accessible with basically no due process. Dr. Peterson, why are you such a Luddite? Why don't you embrace artificial intelligence and facial recognition to, and massive computer surveillance and cameras on every street corner so that we could all be safer? Well, because there's tremendous danger and too much security. There, if, if the emerging collusion between government and corporation, gigantic corporation, continues in the manner that it is continuing, there won't be anything that you do that can't be used against you and will be used against you in very short order. And the concerns that are expressed here about the local consequences of that, let's say with regards to January 6th, seem to me to fail to take into account the much broader threat that lurks underneath that everyone should be attending to. Like we are, we're in danger of eliminating the private sphere entirely. That's already happening in places around the world, particularly in China, which is why I made reference to that. That technology is at hand, and it appears as though both giant governments and giant corporations are used, utilizing it in every way that they can manage. And it's generally, it's often motivated by the claim that that's forestalling an immediate proximal threat, right? Well, that's a short-term justification for engaging in a tremendous long-term danger. And it should be perceived as dangerous to those on the left who are politically committed, because it will be the politically committed who are first identified by such systems. Is, is it true that you have a PhD? Yes. Well, then why did the Canada decide that you needed more education? Can you tell us about that? Well, one reason. The entire transcript of an interview that I did with Joe Rogan was submitted as evidence with regards to the unacceptability of my views. What I was doing primarily in that interview that was criticized was questioning the validity of the economic models of economic collapse that were stacked upon the unstable models detailing out climate change 100 years into the future. And that was deemed in Canada sufficient to proceed with complaints against me with regards to my professional competence to serve as a licensed psychologist. That was only one of many anonymous complaints that were fostered directly in relation to my political views. Well, I thank you for showing up today. I think they may use your testimony as evidence that your re-education has not been successful. <laughs> I yield back to the chairman. <laughs> well done. Uh, the gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Nice. Thank you. Mr. Knight, you uh, come from the Mercatus Center, uh, funded generously by the Koch brothers, 
as was the Cato Institute. Um, and I, of course, represent George Mason University, where you're located. Uh, I have a simple question for you. The Republican conference chair, Elise Stefanik, recently said, people who are being imprisoned for crimes committed during January 6 are hostages. Do you agree, yes or no, that the people who have been arrested, tried, convicted, sentenced, and are serving those sentences are in fact hostages? I have not studied that. My initial inclination is no. And if I can elaborate, I have not, re re I have not read all the transcripts of all the convictions, but I will assume the answer I thank no. you. I, I just find it interesting you can opine about uh, amendments to the Constitution and infringements and warrants, but you haven't really looked at the issue of whether people who committed crimes in January 6 are hostages or not. Thank you for that moral equivocation. Officer of Fanon, do you, maybe you don't want to equivocate. What do you think? I mean, I'm listening to my colleagues, I'm listening to this testimony, and apparently you got it wrong. On January 6th, there were peaceful citizens simply protesting on behalf of their First, Second, and Fourth Amendment rights, carrying Bibles, uh, who had just assembled peacefully to express themselves here in the Capitol. Isn't that what you encountered on January 6th? That couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, my encounter was, uh, was brutal, it was violent. Uh, it involved a number of individuals restraining me, beating me. Uh, at least one individual, while I was being restrained, beaten, uh, subjecting me to uh, electroshock from a taser device on my neck, um, uh, all the while resulting in uh, injuries I sustained as a traumatic brain injury as well as a heart attack. Hmm. So. Mr. Tedesco talked about, among other things, law enforcement running roughshod uh, over citizens exp you know, simply expressing their First and Second Amendment rights. I had the impression that you know, law enforcement that day apparently was violently seizing Bibles of good Christians who were simply trying to exercise their, their faith because we were targeting them for their faith. Is that what happened on January 6th? Listen, I responded to the Capitol that day uh, for no other purpose than to uh, assist fellow officers uh, who were calling out for help. Uh, I didn't care about the location, the Capitol building itself, and quite frankly, I didn't give a shit about the members of Congress. Ah. I just came here because cops needed help. That was it. We'll pretend you didn't say that first part. <laughs> um, by the way, just an oh, by the way, because we've heard some interesting testimony again. Uh, in your law, how long were you in law enforcement? 20 years. 20 years. In those 20 years, were you ever made aware of any effort by the FBI or law enforcement in general to surveil the financial information of individuals because of their beliefs or views? Because that's what we're being led to believe has been a current. No, and I worked uh, in collaboration. I'm sorry, real loud and clear. 20 years of experience, have you ever experienced what they're describing? No. No. Would you find that odd if you did stumble upon it? Yes. Why? Uh, because it violates the very principles of uh, law enforcement, upholding the Constitution uh, and respecting Americans' rights. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run out of time. I just, first of all, I cannot tell you how much, even though I am a member of Congress, I was on the floor on January 6th. I heard it. I saw a lot. I cannot imagine what you've gone through and how you are still living through PTSD. My office was attacked last May, and we're still living through PTSD. And it was violently attacked. Um, and I can only imagine. And you are a hero. And, you know, no matter what the attempts may be of some to minimize, diminish, or even fabricate what really happened on January 6th, I assure you there are a number of us who will continue to fight for the truth to make sure the American people know exactly what happened and that we won't equivocate about whether criminals who are justifiably in jail for their crimes that day are not hostages. They're criminals. They violated the law. And I cannot think of a more 
significant breach of the Constitution than a violent attempt to prevent the free exercise of an election being counted here in the Capitol. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks uh, for the witnesses being here today. And, you know, we're here to talk about uh, apparently a range of things that don't involve the topic of the hearing. And I think that's disappointing. Freedom surrendered is rarely reclaimed. And we have an opportunity to do that. Few of the rights protected by our Constitution are more infringed than the right to privacy. My colleague, Mr. Massey, read the actual text of the Fourth Amendment. And Mr. Peterson, Dr. Peterson, you referenced kind of what a lot of people might wish it said. It does not say that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. It says that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. It doesn't say you have an expectation of complete secrecy. Um, the reasonable expectation of privacy is guarded by due process, warrants and subpoenas for U.S. citizens. You might not know that many of the members of this committee are part of something really rare in Congress, which is a nonpartisan view. We've got divisions that don't break on party lines on privacy. There are Republicans and Democrats who want to roll back the Patriot Act. What a beautiful name, but it's being used to violate American citizens' rights to privacy. We have one of the rarest things possible. You have Mr. Jordan and, and Mr. Nadler in complete agreement on how to reform the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And frankly, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act part works pretty well. It's the Domestic Surveillance Act. Well, there isn't one because the Fourth Amendment guards it. It says you're supposed to get a warrant. And we're covering a giant hole here, not about January 6th, what about the Bank Secrecy Act and third party doctrine? Things that are being abused, weaponized against the citizens of this country. Now they don't have all these same safeguards in Canada and Dr. Peterson, you've experienced some of the consequences of not having the safeguards that we have in this country. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate on, on how consequential it is to have the safeguards we do have here on privacy and speech. Well, I know that my colleagues on the psychological front and on the medical front in Canada are increasingly frightened of making any of their political opinions known in any form whatsoever because governmental agencies, usually of the mid-level bureaucratic sort, have been empowered as a consequence of our lack of First Amendment rights to intervene as they see fit in relationship to stated opinion, political or otherwise, and it's not good. It's seriously not good, and there's new legislation coming up also reflecting that lack of proper constitutional protection that will make even the suspicion that a crime may be committed punishable. That's Bill C-63, which is pending before the Canadians. Yes. These are dangerous House. ideas, and I, I appreciate that you highlighted how China's using it, and frankly, there are people in the United States pushing for a central bank digital currency that at the core is a violation of privacy. It is really the one ring to rule them all. It is a massive amount of coercive power. And at the root of it is, is the surveillance capability. And a lot of that, Mr. Mr. Knight, you've highlighted with the consequences of the Bank Secrecy Act. And I just wonder, you know, a couple of you have highlighted the, the cost-benefit ratio, Mr. Michelle, uh, as well. Uh, maybe you could highlight the consequences of the Bank Secrecy Act and, and uh, how we might reform it so that we can accomplish the uh, stated goal of safety, but in a more constitutional framework. Happy to speak to that. I think what we've seen in this hearing is that one of the big consequences is that people blur the distinction between not being able to access information or being able to access information subject to due process. There's no reason to believe that the uh, um, in it, convictions obtained after January 6th would be impossible without getting a warrant or information subject to one of the exceptions to the warrant provision for exigent circumstances. We also have to worry about the fact that information is being collected and is very collectible. If you are worried about your political opponents having power, why do you want this available to them? Thank you. Uh, you know, Mr. Michelle, you mentioned the uh, third party doctrine 
and the hazard of that. I mean, frankly, um, I, I'm reminded of um, a story that disputed whether it was fully accurate or not, but when Nikita Khrushchev became the leader for the Soviet Union, he was pointing out how brutal the regime had been under Stalin. And someone from a large crowd yelled to him, why didn't you do anything? And here he is, the dictator of the Soviet Union, everyone knowing the kind of power that he could wield. And he said, who said that? I demand to know who said that. And everyone got quiet. And he let it stay quiet for a very long time. And he said, that's why. Because you know the course of power of the state. Now, I would submit that the police state powers that have existed in previous eras of history are minor compared to the capabilities that we have. When you link that to the consequences of the unmitigated third party doctrine, can you lay out for us what's at stake? Well, it, it literally means that anytime you engage in any commercial transaction, you are effectively saying, okay, I don't have due process anymore, which is rather insane. Uh, it turns the concept completely on its head that we all have due process. So I think we have a really incredible burden to, to produce legislation that does reclaim the, fr the freedom that has been surrendered. And I hope we continue to work together in a bipartisan fashion to deliver that reform. Also, I yield back. Gentleman yields Chairman, back. I have a unanimous, unanimous consent from. Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent uh, request uh, entitled, this is an FBI liaison information report entitled Domestic Violent Extremists Emboldened in Aftermath of Capital Breach. It cites uh, online rhetoric regarding the 20 January presidential inauguration with some calling for unspecified justice for the January 6th shooting by law enforcement of an individual at the Capitol building and another positing that, quote, many armed individuals would return on 19 January according to open source reporting. Without objection. Thank you. Gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Hank, just hold, hold one second because we'll, we'll stop your time. I should have mentioned if any of you need a break, just let us know. We'll be, I mean, if you have to run to the restroom or anything like that, just let us know. We've been get, going at this two hours. We've probably got a half hour to go if you can find, but if you need a break, just let, let us know and we'll go there. I apologize. Gentlemen's recognized. No, no problem, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's unfortunate that this hearing is uh, tended to focus on January 6th and the inaugural that followed two weeks later because there is a legitimate question about the gathering of information, mostly by private sector, businesses and the like, and then the government accessing that information. It's a, it's a worldwide phenomena, and it is something that we should be focusing on. Unfortunately, what's happened here in this hearing is that we've taken the January 6th issue, the insurrection, the violence, the harm that came to uh, Officer Fallone and others, uh, and morphed it into a larger question of our civil liberties. Um, that's unfortunate. But here we are, uh, using this hearing to somehow um, degrade the violence and the insurrection itself and the ultimate effort to destroy our democracy. So I think we have to stay with that a few seconds. Um, Officer Fallon, just a couple of questions I want to get clear. Um, do you have the number of insurrectionists, rioters that have been charged and found guilty? Correct. Do you know that you, the number is, I think, over 1,100? Uh, that's my understanding, uh, close to 1,200. Uh, in this process, was any information developed that indicated there might be future violence, for example, at the inaugural? Uh, yes, that's my understanding from uh, uh, speaking to those involved in the investigation. Does, do any of the witnesses disagree with that? Okay. And based on this, is it reasonable for the federal government, FBI, and other agencies to investigate certain individuals in an effort to prevent future violence. Is that a reasonable thing for the government to do? Again, I, I, don't, even, I don't only think it's reasonable, I think that it's a, a requirement. Now, do any of you disagree that it would be reasonable for the federal government to uh, investigate uh, those who uh, were involved 
and the threats that there might be future violence. Is that something that the uh, FBI and others should do? I would disagree with that to some degree. It depends on how they do it. Point because, made. because. Point, thank uh, you. Okay. Point well made. Not, yep. not going to. Okay. okay. Yep. So the, the notion of continued investigation based upon information received uh, as a result of the conviction and investigations of those that were involved in the uh, insurrection, the rioting, uh, would be reasonable. So now we get down to the point, and, and this is where this hearing really got off track, and, and it's unfortunate uh, to equate this issue of our personal civil liberties and privacies with the January 6th insurrection. Uh, we need to divide these two issues. Uh, there's no doubt we had an insurrection. There's no doubt we had a riot. There's no doubt that uh, Officer Cohen, you were injured along with 140 other officers. The film that was shown earlier clearly demonstrates that and your own testimony. We thank you for your, um, your work that day. Uh, I think I agree with Mr. Connolly. Uh, you may not think it important to protect us, but we certainly thought, and we thank you for having done so. But the reality is that uh, it was extraordinary, serious event in America's history. It was the single largest assault on police ever in the history of this nation. Now, based upon that, where do we go? Put that over here. And then, Mr. Chairman, if you would, um, put all of that aside and stop trying to protect uh, Mr. Trump or anybody else that was involved in that riot, in that insurrection, and let's get down to the issue of protecting our civil liberties. There are multiple examples that could be used and evidence that could be used to get to that point. Some of it presented by the witnesses today, unfortunately wrapped up in the January 6th and the, uh, the insurrection and the uh, subsequent question of the inaugural. I do note, as I drove here this morning, that a new fence has been put around the Capitol building. Now, this speaks to all of our safety. And why is it that in America today we have the need for a new seven-foot high fence around the Capitol on the day that the President arrives to give his State of the Union? So I think I'll just leave it there um, with the seconds left. And uh, Mr. Chairman, if you would put aside your desire to go after um, and protect the president and get down to the issues that are really critically important for all of us. I would appreciate it, and I think this country would also. Gentleman, gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Wyoming is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've been focusing on how technological platforms and advancement further fuels the weaponization of the federal government in collaboration with big corporations against the American people. At least that was the intent of this hearing, and it is the intent of the folks on this side of the aisle. Today, it is how developments in financial technology have aided the surveillance of the American people. And during our last hearing, we focused on how AI is expanding the monitoring and suppression of speech. Today, I want to focus on, a, on new reporting which connects the financial surveillance and AI together. Last month, journalist James O'Keefe posted a report alleging that the IRS and DOJ were utilizing AI technology to assist with the surveillance of American bank accounts. These allegations are that AI can access bank accounts and look inside those accounts versus just seeing activities in the account. This surveillance by the IRS is being done without a warrant, and it is being done in coordination with the DOJ. Just two months before this revelation, FinCEN informed us in staff briefings that banks were beginning to deploy AI technology in their business models. Meanwhile, we are watching Google's Gemini's failures from its politically biased model, which Google co-founder Sergey Brin called left-leaning, which I believe is pretty much the understatement of the year. In the report released by this subcommittee last night, we document how the FBI and FinCEN reported information to assist financial surveillance which cert, uh, which certain Americans on certain Americans based on strictly conservative ideas. Mr. Knight, you noted that we are limited to speak on what has been reported related to the financial surve surveillance regime because so little is known by the public in Congress. 
The timeline that I just described provides little de detail, but it does show that this area is developing very quickly and raises further concerns about federal agencies undertaking dragnet surveillance using financial records. Based on what we know so far about the coordination between the financial sector and federal government, does the addition of AI into this equation cause even greater concern regarding the scope and scale of financial surveillance that we can expect to occur in the future? So I, I believe it does for several reasons. One, to the extent that it makes something less expensive, you'll get more of it. Mm -hmm. Two, to the extent that AI is not well-tuned, either intentionally or unintentionally, you're gonna get the risk that you're gonna not only have more false positives, but also that it's gonna start selecting for information that may not be appropriate. Three, there's concern, and I don't wanna overblow the concern, but it does exist, that AI tends to be opaque, and this regime is already opaque enough. Mm -hmm. So if the great and powerful Oz is spitting out records that it considers suspicious, and you don't know why, and we can't assess how appropriate it is, that's obviously very problematic, and so, I think that we do need to be cautious. And, and I would say one distinction between this and, and maybe some other areas is here we're talking about feeding information to the government. So there are constitutional implications here that don't necessarily exist in other areas. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be cautious in other areas, but we should be especially cautious here. I appreciate your response, and I think that you're actually spot on. Also of concern with the evolution of AI in relation to uh, this is the, this liberty infringing regime that we're dealing with right now, the Biden administration, is the fact that it removes, removes human accountability. Um, what we have learned so far is that the information we have so far came from a paper trail from a government employee. Yet with AI, that paper trail is going to disappear. Mr. Michelle, what could, another, what could another layer of secrecy achieved by displacing human action with AI do to further erode our liberties and basic guarantees of privacy? Well, I mean, at first I would just caution that uh, banks and financial institutions have been using technology at, a, at an increasing rate for a very long time, and the problem still, the bigger problem is the principle. And if we guarantee due process and we guarantee that law enforcement needs a warrant to get that information, then I think that's a better place. Uh, but aside from that, yes, the better and the broader the technology allows people to reach or the finer detail that it allows people to get, then obviously the, the, the more of it you're going to get. Uh, but I think Brian is right in that it's going to make it less, more efficient and less costly so you'll get more of it. But again, the principle of the Fourth Amendment, the due process, that's what's key here. Thank you, I appreciate that. With that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Or Texas, excuse me, I'm sorry. Ooh, Texas. Please, there's a huge difference. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you to all the witnesses who are here this morning. On the morning of January 6, I joined my colleagues in the House to certify the historic election of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. But that day quickly became a dark day in our nation's history. Within hours, the Capitol was overrun by domestic terrorists sent there by President Trump. I don't mean terrorists in some academic or legal or political science definition. I mean, I was terrified, my staff with me was terrified, and many of my colleagues around me, both Democrat and Republican, because this is not a partisan issue, were also terrified. Now, some of my colleagues have already forgotten the violence and terror that we all experienced together, and we've heard some of the comments. They think they should be called hostages. They think they should be treated as patriots. Well, there were terrorists, plain and simple, in my books. I learned for the first time that there are gas masks underneath our seats on the House floor designed to keep us from chemical or biological attacks when I was told to put one on. Imagine we were told to put on gas masks. My colleagues and I on the floor were hiding between seats, barricading doors, and some of us calling their families as the mob grew louder and more terrifying. They were pounding at the door trying to get in. Where's Nancy? Hang Mike Pence. Where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? They set up gallows to prevent them from coming in. The intentions of these terrorists were clear. Overturn the election 
and kill the Democratic elected leaders they believed stood in their way. Anyone who claims this was not a terrorist attack, a violent insurrection, is simply not facing reality, and as one witness has said, they're just plain and simple lying. Even in California, they would call that lying. Despite every truth, here we are today. More myths and more misleading information given to the American people. Well, Officer Fanon, thank you for being there and also for having the courage to come to testify today and to remind us all about the truth of that day. Some colleagues wrapped themselves in Blue Lives Matter flags for social media and throw it in the trash for the officers who watched over our democracy. I will never get what I saw and felt that day. And without your sacrifice and some of those who died that day or were injured that day, defending the Constitution and all enemies, foreign and domestic. So Officer Fanon, while law enforcement kept us safe inside the Capitol, outside the building you were facing staggering odds. Reports indicate that the west side of the crowd numbered officers 58 to 1. One officer there requested backup at least 17 times in 78 minutes. Did you and your colleagues ever get the sense that you were defending democracy that day? That's not anything that, that uh, those thoughts never crossed my mind. Um, you know, again, like I said, I, I responded to the Capitol, um, heeding distress calls coming from fellow officers uh, and when I was fighting, I, I was more concerned with my own survival and that of uh, my colleagues than, um, you know, the totality of, of uh, what that day would, would later come to represent. Right. As you reflect now, do, 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 you, do, do you see the connection? Do you see what really was happening that day? It was not just the violence of the mob, but it was the attack on everything that we stand for as a country. Uh, yes, ma'am, that's my assessment. Thank you. Uh, many members of public have spoken about and recorded memories of their experiences, and we know that many, many members of Congress have struggled with trauma from that day. We know that you have. Is it possible, and I know it, it may, may bring a lot of emotion, but is it possible for you to share with, with us on what you have dealt with personally as the after effects uh, of that day? Sure. I mean, initially, I think there was just the um, the experience of the day itself, uh, the level of violence. Um, and for me, um, in my personal experience, I think what was so difficult to deal with was, uh, you know, the first time in my law enforcement career, and I work narcotics, so it's to say that uh, I've experienced a few things. Um, I had never been completely... Um, I had lost all control of my own survival in those moments. Mm -hmm. And it was only because of uh, a few individuals in the crowd uh, and the efforts of law enforcement that I was able to survive that. And so uh, that level of vulnerability for me as an officer uh, was more than, um, uh, than I could deal with. Um, you know, in the aftermath, there was uh, Criticism from, you know, internal criticism on behalf of other officers in the department uh, that made the experience uh, much more difficult. Um, and then eventually the, you know, mischaracterizations, the lies about what happened that day, lies about me specifically um, and who I was or, or what role I played uh, at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, you know, inspiring threats against myself and, and members of my family. Um, I mean, in a way, I think it's impossible to, uh, for me at least, to fully resolve that trauma because, you know, even in attending this hearing today, I received threats. Um, and so, you know, how do you, um, how do you resolve that when it's, it's ongoing? Well, I'm sorry that I'm it happened, and, and uh, thank you for your courage, and thank you for coming and, and uh, sh sharing with us today. I yield back. Uh, generally, as back chair recognized himself, uh, Mr. Michelle, if, if the government's going to go get information from banks, and understand what happened in this particular situation and in other situations, the government goes to the bank and says, I want the name of the customer who's making purchases 
and a certain date time, and I want the name of the customer who may have bought a firearm at any time. If they're going to do that, do you think they need to get a warrant first? Do I think they should? Yes. Well, yes. Mr. Tedesco, do you think we need to get a warrant to do that? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Fanon, do you think they need to get a warrant? I apologize. Sorry. Could you repeat the question? Government, government goes to a bank and says, I want the name of the customer who made purchases on these specific dates and may have bought a firearm at any time. Should there be a warrant requirement before the bank has to be compelled by the government to give that information? Should there be a warrant requirement first? I mean, in my experience, I always sought voluntary compliance. Um, it's less paperwork. Uh, that being said, if, if, if I was unable wait, to- Wait, 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 voluntary compliance. Correct. How's it voluntary? This is the third party, the bank's giving it. No, if I go to the bank and request certain in information regarding an investigation that I'm participating in. I'm just saying in. in a fundamental sense, do you think there should be a warrant requirement before some financial institution hands over the name of the customer based on certain purchases they may have made? Say so in a general sense. Yes. You think there should be? Yes. That's great, because your colleagues don't think so. Now, let me go to this. Do you think, Mr. Michelle, that if it can't do a warrant, do you think there should be at least a notification? So should at least the bank say, hey, Mr. Smith, the FBI just asked me for all your purchases on a certain date, and they want to know if you've ever bought a gun. Do you think that the bank should at least tell their customer, their customer who they're supposed to serve? Do you think they should at least be compelled to tell them that? Yes. Mr. Tedesco? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes, with reasonable exceptions for an ongoing criminal case. Fair enough. Mr. Peterson? They should get a warrant. They should get a warrant. Back to the first thing. Mr. Fallone? Uh, again, with exceptions for criminal investigations. We got, we got agreement on the panel. We've, the first time we've had that th this morning. Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. Dr. Peterson, uh, I want you to talk about the, the, deba the debanking issue we saw so much of and how that was, particularly, I guess, with the truckers, and, and how that's, because I see it coming. I see it coming here, and it frightens me. I want you to talk about what took place in Canada and if, if it in any way impacted you. Well, there was a, essentially a working-class protest against the COVID lock, extensive length of the COVID lockdowns. And one consequence of that was that Canadians who participated, even by donating to the protest and even by donating small amounts to the protest had their bank accounts seized by seized in consequence of a collusion between the banks and the government that was extrajudicial that was recently deemed unconstitutional despite the fact that we don't have strong first amendment claims so this happened it, the government is currently maneuvering in canada to make the possibility of such collusion a certainty across multiple potent actual and potential domains of, of so-called harm, particularly in relationship to government-defined hate. Yes, this is, this is absolutely coming. And it's facilitated by the kinds of advancements in technology that we talked about today. Yeah, we know it's coming because we've seen the, this, what, what do they call it, the liaison information report from the FBI to the bank saying possibly include firearm legislation, the easing of immigration status, new limits on public land, and discontent with renewed measures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So the very issue, the very issue that these truckers were debanked in Canada is the very thing the government is saying to banks, we need to, be, we need to look at this as well, that single issue. That is, again, what frightens me so much. And, and, and frankly, when you're getting this information, if you're gonna get it, why you should be compelled to get the warrant before you go, you go get it. Mr. Knight, jump right yeah, in. I want, to, I want to clarify one part of my answer um, to the second question about notification. Yep. The Right to Financial Privacy Act, I think, does a good job of this, where notification can be delayed, but you have the, the government has to go to a court and get permission to delay. And I think if we're going to- You shift I, the burden. I yeah, mean, the burden, I mean- and the, burdens, well, the burden's where it should be on the government to go 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 get it from a court. Absolutely, and, and I do believe that there should be a warrant requirement uh, so, the, so the notification would only be delayed in that event. In this world we're now in, we, we, the full committee, as I said, I think I mentioned, may, may have mentioned earlier, on the FISA reauthorization, we have said the same thing. If you're gonna go search an uh, American citizens uh, based on their phone number, their email address, in this haystack of information that's out there, if you're gonna do that, go get a warrant. And we're having the same fight there.
But it, it seems to me that, that, that getting a warrant, Fourth Amendment, constitutional uh, right, is how it, has to be, uh, how it has to be handled. My time has expired. I yield to the ranking member. Thank you very much. Um, I thought it was very telling that Mr. Knight said that, yes, going after bank records would be inappropriate, except in a criminal investigation. Ooh, a criminal investigation. That's what the FBI was doing, was involved in a criminal investigation. With a warrant, he's for well, No, not with a warrant. It's not necessary to have a warrant. Go back to criminal procedure. You don't always need a warrant when you have voluntary um, authorization. And everyone who opens a bank account is told when they open their bank account that the information may be disclosed to law enforcement. Now, if we want to change that rule in the consumer protection laws, then we need to do that. But until that, they have a reasonable expectation that law enforcement may disclose that information. Because once you are banking with a banking institution, that information in that record belongs to the banking institution. It doesn't solely belong to you anymore when you are using a bank in that banking institution and they have given disclosure. Now, if we want to make it an affirmative disclosure where an individual has to specifically check off the box that allows them to be aware of it when they're opening a bank, then that's something else. But you do not need a warrant. You can have voluntary disclosure because under our law presently, the banks have possession and ownership of that information. Now, the other thing that I think you have talked about is, are we worried about that, if, that this is only going to happen to the um, on conservatives. No, I'm, I'm, I'm also concerned if that were, if the FBI were to do overreach. I am concerned with that. And I do understand that this is something that law enforcement does and that we need to be careful about what they do. I just find it very interesting that you all are uh, my colleagues, Mr. Uh, our, our, one of our witnesses, Mr. Fanon, is not a colleague of ours and is giving his opinion as a law enforcement officer. Sir, was there something else that you wanted to add? Within the context of this particular investigation, um, one of the reasons why I believe that uh, the FBI would have sought uh, voluntary compliance as opposed to applying for a warrant uh, is the sheer magnitude of the event. You had literally thousands of people who participated on the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And in an abundance of caution and really the responsibility of the FBI and those other investigating agencies uh, is to ensure that that violence does not occur again uh, at our inauguration, uh, which was only about two weeks uh, after that. And so I think it wholly appropriate uh, as you just said, it's <clears throat> completely within our uh, capabilities as law enforcement agencies to seek voluntary compliance uh, from these institutions to investigate criminal acts or potential criminal acts. Thank you. So there was an eminent threat on the American people, on the homeland, that being individuals who said they were going to come back and finish the job that they had started on January 6th to try and stop the, in, the placement of Joe Biden as President of the United States. Now, there's a lot of things we could have hearings on. You, Mr. Cherry, you have not sat down with me at any point in time like we do in other committees and talk about what are the things that we can agree on that we wanna, you came to my office one time and we had a discussion and I gave you a list of things that I would like to have a hearing on. You completely ignored me in that. Your team doesn't even give us testimony until the very last minute that they have to. You do not even let us know the subjects of hearing. Sometimes I find out about what we're gonna hear a hearing is gonna be on on Twitter. You are not operating as a fair dealer in this, so don't try that here in front of everybody. Well, I am concerned about things. I'm concerned about what will happen if Donald Trump does get reelected. Because on November 9th, 2023, in a Univision interview, he said, if I happen to be president and I see somebody who's doing well and beating me very badly, I say go down and indict them. They would be out of business. They'd be out of the election. On November 11th, 
in 2023 at a Veterans Day rally. I can't believe he was at a Veterans Day rally after what he says about those of our men and women in uniform. He said, we pledge to you that we will root out the communist, Marxist, fascist, and radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country, that lie and steal and cheat on elections. He seems to be a threat to the first, the fourth, a whole bunch of amendments, but you're not gonna try and have a hearing on him in this weaponization of the federal government, which we know that Donald Trump is going to use for his own dictatorial, narcissistic, failing, failing in business, failing in presidency, failing in life self. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from North Dakota is recognized. So there's a carjacking outside of 7-Eleven in downtown Washington, D.C., and the cop calls the CEO of Bank America and says, I need every person in your bank who's ever bought a gun anytime, anywhere. It's an ongoing criminal investigation. Everything Everywhere All at Once won the Oscar last year for the best movie, but it's not the standard for a Fourth Amendment warrant. Mm -hmm. And I think this is about as important of a hearing as we can have, because if they're doing it to members of Congress, members of Congress's staff, reporters who are engaging in all of this, imagine what's going on at another time. By the way, the Supreme Court agrees with me, when, and we'll get into that in a little bit. When the Bank of America provided the FBI a list of people who made financial transactions with their Bank of America card in Washington, D.C. between January 5th and January 7th, 2021, the practice of sweeping up thousands of Americans without probable cause and specify in a search for specific suspects is inconsistent with the specificity requirement of the Fourth, or Fourth Amendment and the entire criminal justice system. Considering how many Americans use Bank of America credit or debit cards, this list must have included thousands of people. This list almost certainly included members of Congress, their staff, who were performing constitutionally mandated functions, as well, of report, as well as reporters who were engaged in First Amendment protected activity. Countless of other individuals were swept into this surveillance without probable cause. The list included people who had a history of purchasing a firearm at any time, which is a constitutionally protected activity. So we likely have violations of the First, Second, and Fourth Amendment. The fact that Americans' data is handed over to the feds on a fishing expedition by the banking industry because their customers were present in a particular region or purchased a constitutionally protected item is unacceptable. And I reject any argument that this financial information is subject to third-party doctrine and therefore an exception to the Fourth Amendment. And I've been arguing this for years. The third-party exception in the modern economy threatens to make the Fourth Amendment irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The Fourth Amendment is it's survived telephoto lenses, drones, listening devices, tracking devices. The Fourth Amendment has proved to be incredibly resilient. But this is the place. This is the place where Congress has to act. Because the, and the Supreme Court seems to agree with that concern based on Carpenter v. U.S. Mr. Michel, the majority opinion in Carpenter stated that the cell site location information is, quote, detailed, encyclopedic, and effort, effortlessly compiled. Is the financial transaction data that was released here any less detailed, encyclopedic, and effortly compiled in relation to a Fourth Amendment legal analysis? I don't believe. Can you imagine any judge in the country who would make a probable cause finding to authorize a search warrant for all of this detailed financial information on, on this many people with this set of facts? No. Mr. Tedesco? There's also similarities with this in U.S. v. Chattery. A federal court found that a geofence warrants violate the Fourth Amendment. Geofence warrants are a practice where law enforcement seeks location data on any device within a specific time and geographic region where a crime took place. The court found that it is insufficient for law enforcement to obtain the data based solely on information that a suspect possessed a cell phone while in, while in the general area of a crime, where a crime was committed. Beyond the court's concern with probable cause, it highlighted that no judicial review whatsoever was attained and law enforcement has unchecked discretion to seize the more intrusive data. Mr. Michel, are those the same concerning factors presented with the financial data that was turned over to the federal government in this case? Yes. Mr. Tedesco? <laughs> yes. Mr. Knight? It sounds very similar. My colleagues across the aisle have raised many concerns about broad violations of privacy of financial or technological institutions in trafficking private user data or revealing it to government authorities. In fact, during an energy and commerce hearing debate on comprehensive data privacy, there were several amendments to prohibit the collection of geolocation data on facilities such as Planned Parenthood that banned the that transfer of that data to uh, 
to law enforcement or to government authorities. And we know that the CDC was collecting data to see if people were going to church during quarantine. Church during quarantine. This conversation, how we deal with this, is the fundamental question we have to answer as we move forward. And you can, we can talk about January 6th and the event, and we can talk about all of that, but there were thousands of innocent people that went to Bass Pro Shops in Virginia in the two days before and after January 6th. Doesn't matter how bad you think the event was or where it was or whatever, you cannot get a warrant on somebody for exercising their constitutional rights. And if you can't get a warrant for somebody to do it, then we have to create a situation where banks and large corporations or anybody else, or third-party data brokers, by the way, are allowed to sell that information and law enforcement is allowed to obtain it without get, getting a warrant. This is a fundamental question. It's a perfect place to have it in this hearing, and it is exactly what happened in this case. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow on uh, with my, my colleague from North Dakota, uh, the notion that subpoenas are not sufficient to get information and that every uh, ounce of evidence must be obtained by a search warrant has, of course, been repeatedly rejected by the Supreme Court over and over and over. And this hearing, the reason why, as Mr. Armstrong says, we are talking about January 6th is because, as I understand it, this hearing was initially spurred on by an FBI whistleblower who is not here testifying today. The one who ostensibly had the information about alleged wrongdoing is not here to stand in front of us to testify under oath to be questioned by members of both sides. I want, Mr. Knight, I want to ask you a, a hypothetical. Let's say that there's a riot and an attack on our democracy on a particular day. Uh -huh. um, we'll just call it January 6th for the uh -huh. purpose of this hypothetical. Let's say that the FBI has information that an individual was near the site of the riot that day. And let's say that the FBI had evidence that that individual purchased a firearm in the past six months. And let's say that the FBI had evidence that that same person planned to return two weeks later to interfere with another democratic process involving the President of the United States. Is it actually your testimony here today to say that it is a violation of the Fourth Amendment for the FBI to seek bank records for that individual? May I ask a clarifying question? Sure. So, at least based upon the public information I have available, they did not know on an individualized basis that people were planning to return to cause violence. And I think that's a distinction that's worth that's knowing. That's fine. I, I, I agree with you. That's not in the hypothetical. They just knew they were I, going to return. I believe you, you said something along the lines of evidence that they were coming back to, to interfere. You're right. Interfere. Let's just say that. Do you still, uh, do you think the Fourth Amendment prohibits the FBI from getting bank records for that individual if they don't know that they are going to commit violence? I think that's an easy warrant to get. A warrant? Yeah, I think that would be an easy warrant to get from a judge. So, you, so you're now saying that you need to get a warrant for bank records? I am saying you should have to get a warrant for bank records. The so, status quo so is you, you do you not. Disagree, then, you disagree with the Supreme Court, which has upheld the constitutionality of the Bank Secrecy Act. So if right? you'd like to talk about the, the Supreme Court precedent in the Bank Secrecy Act, I think that Carpenter, which is a far more recent case, points to some very strong questions about the constitutionality of the Bank Secrecy Act. I've written something about it. I'm happy to send I, it to your I office. I understand. And by the way, I, I agree. I mean, but Carpenter also demonstrates that the Supreme Court is evolving and is uh, evolving on the Fourth Amendment, and there's no question, and I will tell you as a former prosecutor, if I had that predication, I would fire off a subpoena to that bank every single day, 10 out of 10 times. Well, respectfully, sir, now, it I'm doesn't sorry, seem just, like they even use subpoenas I have to move here. On. I, I have to move on, because I, I, I think it's, it's absolutely absurd that we are sitting here trying to make an argument that somehow the Fourth Amendment is being violated when there is specific reasonable suspicion about every individual who, whose bank records were obtained because they bought a gun, they were at the insurrection, and they were going to come back. The fact of the matter is, we are once again here on a completely sham rationale. There was no 
First Amendment or Fourth Amendment violation around January 6th. No. This is simply another effort to whitewash what happened on January 6th. One of the members of the committee calls those who were convicted of crimes hostages, while there are actual American hostages sitting in Gaza right now under captivity of a terrorist organization. And we're supposed to equate the people sitting in jail who, uh, who rioted and attacked this capital, we're supposed to equate them with these hostages. Mr. Chairman, you continually say that it used to be that both parties agreed with the First Amendment. It didn't used to be. It is. It remains the case. We all agree with the First Amendment. But the problem is that the First Amendment is not absolute. It does not protect any single thing anyone says. And there are limits, and that's important. And what this committee has been trying to do for the last year and a half is to chill the federal government from monitoring what is going on on social media and, and otherwise out there so that misinformation and disinformation can run rampant in only Elon Musk's social platform and every other social platform so that they, the Republicans, can benefit from it in November's election. Time that is why this committee exists. The time, the time of the gentleman. And we have gotten no evidence to support any of these allegations. The chair, here. The chair recognize here. the gentleman from South Carolina. Uh, I yield to the chairman such time as he may consider. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I think the gentleman from New York just said that we're trying to chill the federal government. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it's ever been said that way. It's always the government trying to chill Americans' rights and chill Americans. I, I've never seen anything. It's called projection. I've never seen anything like But guess what? You know who was opposed to how the FBI and the Bank of America did this thing when they asked for this information? You know who was opposed to it? Three FBI agents. The guys on the case. George Hill. Bonna Vellante, Steve Jensen, all testified to the committee that it was wrong. And guess who else said it was wrong? Chris Ray said this. We recalled this information to avoid even the appearance of any kind of overreach. So even the FBI who was systematically violated Americans, who's this FBI who said, if you're a pro-life Catholic, you're an extremist. If you're a parent going to a school board, meaning you're a terrorist. Even the FBI said, this is ridiculous. And they pulled back. Three agents testified. So, I mean, and, and somehow we're, the federal the government is the one who chills American speech when they pressure big tech to censor, when they ask banks to give them, that's chilling speech. And we've seen it first, Mr. Dr. Peterson's seen it in his own country, and now it's coming here. That's what we're concerned about. I yield back to the gentleman. Thank him for yielding. Thank you, Chairman, and, and I, I would echo that. I, I'm glad that Thomas Massey started off with a recitation of the Fourth Amendment because that's really why we're here. And, and while the other side wants to relitigate J6, the title of the hearing is about financial sur, uh, surveillance of American citizens. This is deeply troubling that if you are a Catholic that cares about your child's education and you shop at Gander Mountain, that you are like prime suspect under some sort of weird uh, rubric and a government surveillance operation. I think the, the Supreme Court, in looking at this, when they were looking at the BSA, in a concurring opinion said, uh, Justice Powell and Justice Blackman said, financial transactions can reveal much about a person's activities, associations, and beliefs. At some point, government intrusion upon these areas would implicate legitimate expectations of privacy. Moreover, the potential for abuse is particularly acute, whereas here, the legislative scheme permits access to this information without invocation of the judicial process. So, Mr. Tedesco, how do we get here? And at what point, or how do we get to a point where big banks can just freely hand over this information to the federal government? Well, I think the biggest concern from our perspective is the systemic censorship risk within the banking industry that is really um, a product of the oversight and pervasive regulatory authority that bank supervisors have over banks. If you think about the top five banks have 50% uh, of the bank deposit market in the United States, you see that there's a concentration of power in the banking industry that just a few banks that are heavily regulated. And because of the secrecy around bank supervision, the reasons why people are debanked and why these kinds of things are occurring is, are, is shrouded. And so it's a huge problem. The censorship risk is real in the financial industry sector. Who would you consider to be the biggest victims of this surveillance operation? 
I think it's the American citizens, and I think it's a bipartisan issue. I, even our, even the um, uh, some of the Democrats in this chamber and in the Senate sent letters to the big banks just a few weeks ago, talking about de-risking. They call debanking de-risking. We're talking about the same thing, uh, of Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, in, including because of their religious donations and ch donations to charity. So, it's a bipartisan issue, and I think we all should be concerned about it and try to work together for solutions. No, I 100% agree with you, and and. You know, what, what do you think right now under the BSA, under the current structure, what is the remedy for Americans? Well, there, there isn't there much. There is none, there isn't. right? There is no mechanism for judicial review, right? So Americans cannot protest a bank who is ostensibly an arm of the government at this point. They cannot protest the disclosure of their financial transactions to the federal government. There's no mechanism for that, is there? That's right. And so, the, and obviously, they don't have any knowledge that their their data was collected to begin with, do they? Yeah, I think one of the scariest thing I, things I heard at this hearing was what Mr. Michelle said: once the bank has the data, the government has the data. Right. Can you hire a private security firm to search somebody's house without a warrant? I, I don't think so. No. No, you have to have a warrant. So, what is the difference here? It's a big risk, and. It needs to be fixed. You, so you, th and you would articulate, let me ask you the, the panel this, do you think that under the current BSA or other laws that, the, that, that it would be wise, given, given where we are from a technological standpoint, do you think it would be wise to revisit the BSA or the other laws to provide that protection for Americans' privacy, sir? Well, there were some concerns expressed earlier about what might happen in the aftermath, let's say, of Donald Trump's election with regards to uh, political belief and anything that facilitates the collusion between government and giant corporation and enables that kind of information gathering will absolutely be used in that way. That's why I made comments earlier regarding this as a bipartisan issue. Once this capability exists and it's being magnified now, it will be used in all directions. So the people at risk will be politically active, vocal Americans. The silent ones will remain relatively safe. But Thank anyone who speaks. And, and, and briefly, do you all think that, that, that we should examine? We should absolutely examine it. Agree. Yes, definitely. Yes. Gentlemen, gentlemen's Thank time you. has expired. The Excuse gentlelady me, from Mr. Florida is recognized. Mr. Chair, I have a point of order. In your last statement, you said that Steve Jensen of the FBI opposed the collection of this information for banks. That's a misrepresentation yeah, of his testimony. Not an appropriate Jensen point of order. said the that the information was not used. Would you release the transcript so that we can That's hear exactly what Mr. Jensen said? Not an appropriate said. point of order, and the gentlelady knows that, but she continues to try to ask Same way you do. Same way portable. you interject. I don't think sir. I've raised one point of order today. You interject all the, the time. The gentlelady from sir. Florida is recognized. All the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm actually just, I continue to be stunned by the big government advocates that we come across and the ones that serve in this very chamber, uh, they're not even hiding it anymore. They're saying the quiet part out loud. They want dependency, they want control. And the total disregard for the Constitution and the oath that many of my colleagues, actually all of my colleagues have taken uh, and violated, it's just, it's so disturbing to me. Many people know, probably as evidenced by what is on the, the face of, of my iPad, that I detest big government and I detest big tech. The two combined have proven to be a lethal combination when it comes to liberty and freedom. Because quite frankly, we know that the MO of big tech and big, big financial institutions combined with big government, it's to erode and evade Americans' constitutional rights. And we're here today because of a blatant Fourth Amendment violation where big banks colluded with big government to turn over data that didn't belong to them to target Americans, innocent Americans. Because in this country, it is still a fact that you are innocent until proven guilty despite what everyone is trying to do and flip that around. Now, Dr. Peterson, it's good to see you again. I couldn't help but notice your reaction when my colleague was talking about the First Amendment uh, not being absolute. And so I do want to give you the opportunity to, to weigh in and respond to that. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but notice your reaction. But before I do, I am really glad that you have been talking about the um, social credit system that the CCP, the, the Chinese Communist Party utilizes. I, I am literally around the corner in a classified briefing while right now talking about the use of big tech and how it is targeting uh, American citizens. In fact, this very morning, I have been inundated in my office with phone calls from TikTok users who have been denied access to the app 
because they live in my congressional district and until they call my office and demand that I do not take adverse action against the app, that they cannot use it. Talk about big tech directing behavior. I think that we are on a very dangerous path and I wanna give you my time to really lay out in the most succinct way possible the danger, the dangerous nexus of big tech, big government, and financial institutions that seek to weaponize that information against Americans. And I know you are more than capable of doing that in two minutes and 30 seconds. Well, I don't think people understand the degree to which they are profiled online and to which their virtual representation is now a iconic representation of them, nor do they understand that they have no rights whatsoever to that representation. So for example, let's say we turn our information about our purchasing habits over to the bank when we open a bank account. 30 years ago, that wasn't such a big problem. With AI systems, it's a problem that's so big you can't imagine it. I mean, I'm certain that I, my staff could find the data online to absolutely predict your voting patterns with 95% accuracy. You have no idea what sort of digital footprint that you're, you're leaving behind you. And there are almost no protections for that. And so, now, the, and you also asked about the First Amendment. Yes. Well, we have very weak free speech protections in Canada. And I can tell you that is not going well. And so the combination in my country, the combination of that and the in, invasive technology that we're producing at a rate that is, beggars the imagination, um, produces a threat to the integrity of sovereign citizenship, the likes of which has not yet been experienced, right? And that's what this committee should be concentrating on. Like, it's very interesting to watch it because it devolves continually into discussion of a, a, a particular event, serious though that event was. It's like, no matter how serious that event was, it pales in comparison to the potential severity of the issue that we're attempting to point to with regards to our testimony. The, these artificially intelligent systems can do things you can't imagine. And not only can they, they are and they will. And that will be abetted by the collusion between large corporations and government. And it's certainly the case that the people who stand on the left, especially with regards to their, what would you say, skepticism of large corporations, which is often, often perfectly warranted, should be utterly terrified about this. Man, you did that in less time than I thought. <laughs> well, I had to get it right once today. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. And I think you have seen it front and center, certainly. We all watched in horror as the truckers' bank accounts were, were seized, were shut down, who protested the mandates. And people think that that's such a faraway concept, but we have seen that here with people who have been given ultimatums of jab or job, and we've seen ways that they've been targeted and, and positioned in ways that are just un-American, unconstitutional. So thank you all to our witnesses for being here today. I appreciate you guys in the fight against weaponization, and we're seeing it more and more every day. Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield. General Lady yields back. This concludes today's hearing. We thank our witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee today. And I apologize, I do have to run out to another thing, but uh, we really appreciate the discussion that you all brought uh, and, and the analysis that you brought today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.